Perfect. Thank you, everybody, for coming. It's nice to see everybody. We have a lot of guests, so I would like to get this moving and call the meeting to order. If we could all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Carol, roll call when you're ready. Jim Batson. Here. Kara Benjamin. Don Carmichael. Here. Kara Drumkey. Here. Lisa Hessel. Here. Sonal Kulkarni. Here. Casey Rooney. Here. Okay, we note all members present. Uh, quick review of the agenda. We will have an invitation for public comment, limiting each comment to three minutes. Uh, we are looking forward to a District 128 safety and security presentation, followed by the student school board representative reports. We do have a FOIA request that we'll review, and we will move on to celebrate some good news. Uh, in our consent vote agenda, which is items that are routine that we normally uh, approve in one motion, meeting minutes, employment employees, uh, educational tour requests, bills payable, um, these are things that we have discussed extensively in committee and will um, approve in one motion. Are there any board members wishing to remove anything from the consent vote agenda this evening? No. Seeing none, it will remain intact. Um, we'll move on to number four discussion, where we will discuss our first reading of some board policies, um, as well as uh, some financial projections for our strategic plan. We will have a financial year 23 mid-year review. And then items for action are um, listed. I'm not gonna read all of them. Uh, we will discuss those individually before um, approving. And then we've got some items, number six for information. We'll have a superintendent's report from Dr. Herman. We will share some board comments and events from some learning and um, events that board members have attended. Uh, do we have an IS IASB report tonight? We have a brief report from ISB, Cedal. Uh, no report from Cedal tonight, so we will move on to E. Any other reports that we might have, um, and then number seven, we'll discuss future agenda items. We will be retiring to executive uh, session to discuss employment of an employee under um, Section Five ILCS One Twenty Slash Two C One. When we move to reconvene in open session, no further action will be taken. So. Um, I'd like to invite anybody wishing to address the board to the podium for public comment. Looks like we do not have anyone going once, going twice. Do we have, uh, we no longer have email public comment, so I am moving right on to our District 128 safety and security presentation. Thank you. Um... Well, we'd like to present um, to everyone here uh, and to the board and to our student board representatives, um, just an overview of our safety and security for District 128. Um, I wanna introduce some of the people that will be presenting with me tonight. Um, we, starting over there, standing up, uh, Wayne Kincaid from the village of uh, Libertyville, school resource officer. Um, our assistant principals, Eric Marosher, assistant principal at Libertyville High School. Um, Greg Stilling, assistant principal at Vernon Hills High School. Dan Mead, uh, school resource officer at um, uh, Vernon Hills High School from the village of Vernon Hills. Um, also in attendance today uh, with us, and they can help answer any questions if you have it, our uh, director of campus safety. Um, and so uh, Todd Williams at Vernon Hills High School and uh, Bob Ulix at Libertyville High School. So welcome. Um, and so I will start just uh, an overview of um, what we're going to talk about today, uh, crisis and emergency response information, some of our building security measures, some of the technology that we have in our schools, um, some of the other safety and security measures, including school personnel, some of our proactive safety measures, and then some of the community resources that we utilize together um, to ensure our um, schools are safe. So, you know, really what drives, oh, if we can move to slide three there, please, sorry. Um, 
the next one. Uh, so really what drives, um, you know, our, you know, campus safety, um, building and school safety is really board policies 4170 and 4190. So those board policies are um, very uh, general board policies about school safety. Um, and then it does refer to some of the requirements um, in Illinois that we follow. And we'll get into some of those requirements as we go through the presentation. Um, and we, one of the things that we look at uh, yearly is, first of all, we review the board policies yearly. Um, the other things that we review are our emergency response procedures. Our emergency response procedures um, include a couple of things. They not only um, include the emergency response procedures in the case of um, an emergency in the school, um, whether that's a fire, whether that's um, a lockdown drill, but some of the other things that we have in our procedures is um, unfortunately maybe a death of a student. Um, you know, death of a staff member. And so that's uh, included in our crisis team information. So that's also important for us. And we review that uh, yearly. It's reviewed by our team. It's reviewed by uh, police and fire departments. And we get together uh, yearly, a couple times a year. By law, we're required to get together once a year and review our safety, but we do uh, meet a few more times. Back in September, 2019, we also had an outside firm uh, facility engineering associates. They came in, reviewed um, our procedures. They also walked through the buildings and looked a lot at our, um, you know, safety that we have in place in the buildings and gave us feedback. Um, and we, you know, did make some changes um, from that. So that was 2019. The other thing that we have kind of in the buildings, we have an emergency response kit um, in each building. We also have what we call like a command center emergency room in each building. That, um, that our phone lines will still work. There may be an old phone system. So a lot of things are uh, digital now and hooked up to our computers, but if you lose power that we do have um, place in our building that we're able to still operate from in the case of emergency. The next slide. At both campuses, there are state mandated drills that the schools take part in. These drills include tornado drills, bus evacuation drills, fire drills, and lockdown drills. With regard to lockdowns, teachers at both buildings show a lockdown video to their students prior to the schools conducting the actual school-wide lockdown drill. These videos are required viewing for all substitute teachers, all out-of-building coaches, all out-of-building music teachers, and all students and staff to view. Each of the schools has their own lockdown video tailored to the nuances of that building. The specific video we're going to view is the LHS lockdown video. Hello, my name is Wayne Kincaid and I'm the school resource officer here at Libertyville High School. I'm going to show you the procedures for a school lockdown. For those of you who are unfamiliar, a school lockdown is a means of securing the building and its occupants from both internal and external threats. There are seven steps involved in a school lockdown. Step one, look into the hallway and bring in any students and staff. Teachers, upon hearing the lockdown alarm, you should check the hallways outside your room. Have those students and staff members in the hallway immediately enter your room and close your door. Please keep in mind that the classroom doors are default locked. Students should enter the nearest classroom that they are directed towards. In the absence of a nearby classroom, you should secure yourself in the nearest room as soon as possible, or leave the building if you are near an exit. Please keep in mind that if you leave the building, you may not know the location of the threat. Please exercise caution. If students and staff members are outside of the school, when a lockdown has been initiated, do not make any attempts to enter the school. If you see the exterior lockdown strobes activated, leave the area until you've been notified by officials that the area is safe and secure for you to return. Step two, close the door and make sure it's secure. Please make sure that you pull the door closed. The fob activated locks will only function for 30 seconds after a lockdown is initiated, which will provide the user a short period of time to open an already closed door with your fob. 
Once 30 seconds has elapsed, all fobs will be deactivated until after the conclusion of the lockdown. Step three, close the room's blinds. Closing the blinds prevents threats from seeing possible targets, both directly and by reducing the amount of ambient light inside the room. This also makes the room appear as if it is empty. Step four, turn off all lights. Like step three, turning off the lights reduces the chances of being seen by a potential threat. If a threat can't see you, the likelihood of harm is reduced. Step five, find the blind spot or safe corner of the room and away from the door. Staying away from the door and out of sight in conjunction with step three and four reduces the likelihood that you will be detected by a threat. It may also reduce your chances of injury should a door be breached. Step six, silence cell phones and stay off cell phones. Although you may be tempted to use your cell phone, doing so may increase your risk of harm and place first responders at disadvantage. It is important to silence your phone and stay off of them. If a threat can't hear you, it can't find you. Additionally, if a large number of people use their cell phones at the same time, it can overload the cellular network and obstruct communications for first responders. Please stay off your cell phones. Step seven, be prepared to blockade the door if needed and be prepared to fend off anyone penetrating the room. There may be a need to blockade the door. There are many ways to do this, whether it is by placing furniture such as desks and bookshelves against the door or binding the door arm with a belt. You should use whatever objects you can to blockade the door as effectively as possible. In a lockdown situation, where a threat is present, the police will make effort to arrive at the scene and stop the threat as soon as possible. However, there may be a need for you to take action prior to police intervention. As a last resort, if your door is breached by a threat, you have every right to take whatever measures necessary to protect yourself. Use whatever items you have available. These items can include books, Chromebooks, staplers, etc. Protect yourself with whatever means you have at your disposal. Now that we have gone through the steps to a lockdown, let's review. Step one, look into the hallway and bring in any students and staff. Step two, close the door and make sure it's secure. Step three, close the room's blinds. Step four, turn off all lights. Step five, find the blind spot or safe corner of the room and away from the door. Step six, silent cell phones and stay off cell phones. Step seven, be prepared to blockade the door if needed and be prepared to fend off anyone penetrating the room. I hope that this information was both informative and helpful. By following the proper procedures, we can greatly reduce the risk of harm should a threat arise. Ultimately, Prevention is our greatest asset. Please notify LHS staff should you ever hear of any threats directed against the school and its occupants, even if you believe it may be a joke. If you have any additional questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you for your attention and be safe. Slide six, please. During a drill like the one you just watched in the video, the school's IT department runs a live diagnostic on all doors, all door readers, all lockdown strobes, as well, as well as many aspects of the system. Simultaneously, during lockdown drills, the school's local police department, as well as the school's main office administrators, team directors, and campus safety team check an array of areas during and following the drill. During a lockdown drill, emails are automatically sent to all three schools and the district office and driver ed teacher vehicles are notified of the drill as practice for an actual event. Again, as a safety precaution, all staff fobs work for 30 seconds following the initiation of a lockdown and then are deactivated. Police fobs are always active, so they have a full access to the building to protect its occupants. Following each and every drill, a feedback assessment document is sent out to all staff to make sure that any issues or questions about the lockdown drill can be addressed. Hey, everybody. Uh, we can go to the next slide, Bo. <clears throat> so as you can see here in the pictures at the front entrances of both buildings, 
we've installed safety bollards um, at the main entrances and alternative entrances at both buildings that would limit cars from either accidentally or purposefully trying to run into the entrances of the schools. Uh, we've also installed a bullet resistant safety film um, on the glass entrances and many of the first floor glass glass on both buildings uh, to prevent someone from trying to shoot their way into the building, which you'll see a video of here that Bo's going to play right now. So as you can see from the video, that that slows them down quite a bit, which in that time we're getting everybody in lockdown. Our friends from the police department are on their way. And now the bad guy doesn't know where we are when he does eventually get access to the building. So that's the purpose for that. Um, <clears throat> the entrance doors are locked daily at the start of school. We have a two-stage entry system at our front doors that most of you have experienced when you come in. Um, you know, this allows our campus safety team to first assess who the person is, let them in, and then before they get entrance into the building, establish who they are, ask for their ID, and then allow them finally entrance into the building once they establish that this person is safe and someone who we want in our camp on our campus. Um, visitors who come to other doors can hit the security button. That has a camera feed so we can see who they are, ask who they are, and either buzz them in or more often than not, just ask them to come around to the main entrance so we can let them in there. Um, next slide, please. Um, visitors are checked in through Raptor technology, which searches a national sex offender database and a list of local visitors that should not be allowed in our building. Uh, once campus safety has established they are someone who belongs in our building. They're given an ID badge to wear throughout our building so we know who, they're, who they are. Uh, next slide, Bo. Uh, some of the other features we have at our front desk include a computer system with the cameras on it so that you know, campus safety can keep an eye on the building from the front door at all times. Um, they also have access to radios that gives them the ability to communicate with our school resource officer, the team leaders, and school administrators for whatever needs we have. Good evening, everybody. So we have 207 cameras that monitor the inside and the outside of this building 24 seven. We can watch the cameras from the security office or from the east and west entrances of the building. When needed, we can review the security film to see almost anything that's happened inside the building. The Vernon Hills and Libertyville Police Department have access to our camera feed and can pull up any film as needed for their own purposes. The camera feed can also be accessed remotely from computers or via mobile devices. Our outside cameras can help us monitor any activity or disturbance in the parking lots, the stadium, or anywhere else outside the building. Again, we can use video playback to review accidents or any other incidences that have occurred on our property. Thank you. Next slide. All right, uh, we use security signage to also help us maintain the safety of uh, staff and uh, 
students at uh, Libertyville and Vernon Hills. Uh, that security signage uh, includes no trespass signs, uh, security video signs, uh, required photo ID signs, um, and all bags are subject to uh, search. All right, next slide. We use uh, several security features. The majority of doors uh, have key fobs, all right, which is an electronic type lock. Um, we've gotten away from the uh, older locks. Um, this is much more efficient. And as it was discussed in the video, after 30 seconds, when going to a lockdown drill, um, it secures uh, the rooms for staff and for students. Uh, there are emergency call buttons in every classroom, all right. We also have a uh, school lockdown is uh, accessed in multiple areas, okay? And by those blue readers that was in the previous sign, those are lockdown readers that certain individuals can access and uh, initiate a lockdown, right? There are more security features. Uh, we use a PA system, which was talked about earlier with internal and external alarms and strobes. Uh, as you can see with the video here, once it starts, that blue strobe that's there, that is a lockdown strobe, okay? All right, we also have uh, communication systems to staff and appropriate community partners. <laughs> and uh, we also use Securely, which monitors uh, students' computers. And that helps out a lot um, when any kind of uh, they put any kind of keywords in, search words, it really notifies us if they're having issues or uh, if we need to look at that student or call home that student. And it's happened, I would say, multiple times throughout the year where uh, myself, the other officers here have had to contact uh, parents at home, even on weekends or after school hours. So it does help a lot. All right, both buildings employ full-time campus safety personnel. Uh, Todd and Bob head up those teams. Uh, they're located throughout the building and the parking lots, patrol the exterior of the campus. Many of them have experience as former firemen or have worked in area police departments. All members of these teams have ongoing training that includes CPR and AED training. Um, some parts of their ongoing daily responsibilities include monitoring the cameras, building entrances, restrooms, parking lots, the cafeteria, and other key areas of the facility. Um, our school SROs, uh, you've just heard from them, their goal is to provide a safe learning environment, provide resources to staff, students, and parents, and create and maintain positive relationships with the students. Their goal really is to reduce juvenile crime by helping students formulate awareness of rules rather than just catching kids in the act. Um, our SROs address these matters not only as law enforcement officers, but as mentors and guest speakers. They really work closely with the school administration in regards to safety and security. They frequently are guest speakers in classes and are just available to answer our kids' questions uh, that they may have in regards to the law. Um, our SROs are parts of our emergency response teams, threat assessment, and crisis teams. Um, all right, next slide, Bo. Um, <clears throat> the relationships built by school personnel is one of our really most important school safety initiatives. Uh, you heard Wayne say it earlier in our lockdown video. We encourage kids if they see something or hear something to say something. Both schools have learning support teams that build relationships with kids and help work, uh, helped to work our disenfranchised students to feel better about their school experience. Um, our goal is for all of our kids to enjoy their high school experience. And our teachers are the ones in the trenches with the kids every day. They utilize the LST when they have concerns about a change in behavior from one of our students. We have a variety of ways they can report that concerning behavior to the LST and campus safety. And, and that's really how we prevent a lot of 
dangerous situation from happening. So that's that group there. In addition to the aforementioned and the more brick and mortar aspects of campus safety, both schools have a number of proactive safety measures. Both schools utilize an online bullying report located on the school's website. When filled out, these reports go directly to the assistant principals, the team directors, and the associate superintendent. The school's LSTs or learning support teams conduct weekly meetings regarding students, but the reality is the team members communicate with one another throughout the day, every day, and on a regular basis with other LSTs in the building. Staff can at any time send an LHS help or VHHS help email. This is an email that when sent by staff members goes directly to all members of all LSTs, as well as the assistant principal and the SROs at that given school. Both schools engage in restorative justice practices, as well as Green Dot at LHS and VH Give at Vernon Hills High School. Another significant proactive area is the student participation in fine arts, athletics, student activities, and community groups. One of the best kept secrets to both the schools are the school campus safety teams. These teams are consistently checking the perimeter of the building, entrances, hallways, as well as checking the restrooms to make sure that students are safe and they're secure. That said, they're also watching the affect of our student, uh, students. Campus safety at both schools are out and about with our students and report immediately to learning support teams. Any signs a student might be in distress, anxiety, or uh, could be, or could it present potentially abusive signs or that they're under the influence. Both schools security teams do an amazing job at this. Additionally, several members of our uh, campus safety teams are former law enforcement officers. We're fortunate to have their expertise, knowledge, training and care for students. Each morning, a member of the campus safety team reviews a summary of the prior nights and early mornings building activities, should there be any. The SRO, head of school safety team, and the assistant principal review the summary consisting of video and a written documentation each and every morning. Further, each morning, the assistant principal, SRO, and director of campus safety get a morning report of the building's exterior doors. The purpose of this is because during the winter months, and as the weather changes, the outside doors tend not to close properly, and these daily door checks let us know immediately so we can have our building and our grounds team make any adjustments to the doors needed. As part of, a part of, as part of campus safety is making sure that our perimeter is always locked tight. Uh, slide 20, please. Each building has a threat assessment team. This team should not be confused with either the emergency response or crisis team. This team works together to assess threat levels of potentially serious situations should one arise. And this is an additional team that was developed in 2019 that will continue to develop as additional training evolves. To review some of the um, community resources that we have available. Um, again, we do an annual safety review with our local police and fire departments and school personnel. And this again is required by um, our regional office of education. And we submit all the materials to our regional office. Um, and the, re the yearly drills that we kind of, uh, we covered, we talked about, um, those are in cooperation also with our local police and fire department. So when we are conducting drills, they're on site, they're watching um, to see any, you know, anything that we need to improve upon when we're um, doing our lockdown drills, our fire drills, or our tornado drills. So it's always nice to have them involved um, during our drills um, so that if you know there comes a time um, that they've been a part of it and they can help us out. Um, you saw the instructional video that we send to our students and our staff. Um, and the other thing to think about is that in a high school, we're outside um, quite a bit for driver's education, for outdoor education, for physical welfare, for science classes. And so we do have some procedures in place for those outdoor classes, um, and we try to um, review those. Sometimes during lockdown drills, students, you might find out we may not do it at the same time um, you know, of the day. We may pick a lunch hour. We may pick you know, uh, an odd time because you just never know, uh, you know, unfortunately, it's not always gonna be during second period or third period that a situation may happen. So we do try to look at different times during the day so that our students and our staff um, can adapt and be prepared. 
Um, one of the other things that we um, have started doing is some tabletop exercises um, with our local police and fire departments. We conducted one a, a few weeks ago um, where we had um, representatives from both um, Village of Vernon Hills, Village of um, Libertyville, and also Countryside Fire. Um, and we went through different scenarios, um, posed different questions, kind of changed the scenarios we went to see how would we adapt. Um, and I know the schools um, also will be doing, you know, uh, tabletop exercises with their administration and their learning support teams. Um, the other thing that you may not be aware of, we also open our schools up for some rapid deployment training in our buildings. Some of those happen um, later in the evening um, and some happen on the weekends that we allow them, the, the um, Village of Libertyville and the Village of Vernon Hills to utilize our buildings to practice um, part of it it's good for us. They get to know our building, um, especially maybe um, staff that don't generally work during the day. They work evenings, but they may have to come into the buildings and help out. So they get to know the, you know, the, the buildings a little bit. And also um, they do get to um, go through their drills. So um, I did apologize. I forgot to also introduce Deputy Chief um, Hollabetz from um, Vernon Hills. He's, he's here um, as we go through again. Really like to thank you know Village of Vernon Hills, um, the community support that we get from Libertyville and from Countryside um, is phenomenal. Um, what we're able to do in partnership, being proactive, is very helpful. And when I talk to other schools, uh, I think um, what we get from our community is far and above a lot of other places. So we are very lucky. So. The drills that we do out throughout the year, we do have some appreciation, some outreach programs, um, you know, for um, all of those community um, partners. Part of it is to get them into our building so students see that the people that we work with are really good people and that they can reach out to them anytime um, for help or answer questions. We really want to build that partnership. So um, I really would like to thank all of them. And now I'd like to open it up for any questions from our board and anyone can answer, or I may just point at somebody to come answer your question. We appreciate you sticking around for some questions. We do understand um, this board tends to ask really great questions and there might be some that for security reasons or other reasons you can't answer in a public setting. So uh, with that in mind, I'll open it up to the floor for any questions from board members. I just wanted to refine um, how a lockdown drill is initiated. So I, I realize you explained there was, um, there are, are maybe like poles or handles within the hallways set up around the buildings. Um, are those all throughout the buildings in certain places? And you said certain individuals have access to unlocking them and pulling them to initiate the lockdown. Um, so is that pretty much administration and our SROs? So that's a little different than a um, a fire pole station. A fire pole station, anyone can go and 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 pull the fire. Um, you know, if they see a fire in a lockdown situation, there's only certain people. So our administration um, in the buildings, our campus safety, uh, and our school resource officer have access to those pole stations. Those pole stations are at all security um, desks and stations in our main offices, and then other key locations around the building. So that, you know, for example, if we're here, we can get to those, you know, pretty quickly. Thank and you. then that's initiated. So when you, it, it's actually a pull station. When you pull up on a, a, an alarm will go off that nothing has happened. That alarm is so that people aren't just, you know, flipping, uh, you, you know, the um, thing up all the time. But, uh, and then the fob is what ac actually activates it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we don't know that our doors are open or closed. We have to actually physically go around and check them. Our system knows if they're open or closed, but we also go around and check them and see if there's any abnormalities, you know, throughout the day. So they all have position switches on them. And if you look at, um, just take, for example, Vernon Hills High School as compared to Libertyville High School. Libertyville built, built in the 50s. The Vernon Hills built in 2000, the difference in the number of doors, and you'll see even in newer schools that the number of doors and accesses keeps decreasing. 
So at Libertyville High School, unfortunately, there are 52 exterior doors. And at Vernon Hills, there are a lot less than that. Uh, you know, just the, huh? mid 30. So, but even if you go, so we're going from 50 to 30, and then newer schools have even less access. Uh, I also have a concern that there's not anything uh, that I saw in the presentation uh, that indicates what we're doing to uh, ensure buy in. Uh, most of the cases where uh, violence has occurred in high schools have happened because a door was left open or an interior door that normally that should be locked was left open. Um, I know that when I was a teacher, I had an outside door and on a beautiful day, I had my door open. That would never be allowed now. Like, do we have an active process where we look for buy-in or we teach buy-in? Do we talk to the teachers about what happens if you do leave that door open? Yeah, I, I would say that we sent out quite a bit of information, whether it's through email. Now, so not just at the beginning of the year, but there are reminders throughout the year. Um, and then when we do um, a drill, there is the feedback portion of it also. So in a, in a drill, um, and I've um, participated as um, somebody that walks around during the drill, we take notes on what's happening or any abnormalities. And then um, Eric at uh, Libertyville and Greg at Vernon Hills collect those. And sometimes they'll have individual conversations with teachers, with staff members, um, not just a collective email. Hey, you need to do this. We'll go and follow up with you know individuals if they do see concerns. That's the other reason too with um, why campus safety does walk around during the day. If they do see something out of order, they will bring that back to the team and then we'll have those conversations. And I would say that um, our teachers, staff are excellent during our drills. They give excellent feedback because they're also concerned about the safety of themselves and their students. And so, you know, to me, they do an excellent job of being proactive um, in that regards. And then also during the drill and they do take, uh, when you go through, if, if, if anybody ever wants to come to a drill, it, you can hear anything throughout the building. It is the quietest I've ever heard a high school when we operate, you know, um, the drill because you walk by classrooms and you do not hear anything. So I know we're getting buy-in from our students and I know we're getting buy-in from our staff that they do take it seriously. Thank you. And then just two other comments. Uh, I was really glad to see that uh, it wasn't all hardscape. Like, I think that building relationships is probably going to be the biggest thing that allows us to avoid problems in the long run. Um, making our kids feel welcome, being sure that they're not being ostracized or bullied. Uh, those are the things. And uh, so I was really glad to see that that was a piece. Uh, and also, thank you. Just thanks for being there. Thanks for helping us. I appreciate what you do. What other questions do we have? Thank you. I know right. that um, we can't do what we do without you doing what you do. The safety of every student, staff member, and visitor to our buildings is our number one priority. So thank you. Um, we know you take your job very seriously, as do we. Um, these are the type of things that, you know, keep uh, principals and uh, administrators and teachers and students and board members up at night. And um, knowing that these things have been so well thought out and orchestrated and rehearsed by really seasoned professionals, um, really, I, I can't thank you enough for the work that you do. Again, we can't do what we do without what you do. So thank you. Lack that it lacks the the applause at the end. So, thank you, whoever started the applause. Always good to have a round of <laughs> of, of applause. Um, moving on uh, to item C in communication, I'll turn it over to our student school board representatives. 
Hi. Uh, this last month has brought a bevy of emotions from students, from final stress to winter break elation. Burn Hill's school-wide final survey sought to collect and identify these sentiments, especially as they relate to this year's final schedule. 70% of respondents had a positive response to the final schedule, with 40% of people responding positively to finals overall. Despite these positive overall metrics, most students rated their stress levels very highly. Though stress is not entirely surprising with most students taking over three finals, students expressed how they believe their stress levels could be reduced. The most popular request was for more provided study materials. Students expressed interest in engaging with more in-school review opportunities, with 10% using the ARC as a final study resource. A contingent of students requested the ability to, to not attend school during periods when they did not have finals, shorter days, and more final days. Some students identify this combination fondly as one that they'd experienced in the winter of 2019. Overall, students liked the final schedule, with some wanting a schedule that more closely emulated that of four years ago. The emotional state of Cougars has been the focus of staff members like prevention and wellness coordinator Miss Dillon, especially near finals. The highly attended Fun Friday events and VHD activities brought smiles to the faces of Vernon Hills schools, high school students. Miss Dillon highlighted the importance of shared happiness at school as a component of social emotional learning and a semester transition de-stressor. The decreasing, the decreasing of disparities in SEL is being addressed through increased activity offerings and the strengthening of existing ones. Spirit weeks, club involvement, and student support groups were all brought up by Ms. Dillon as ways that previously isolated students could better connect to community. The Cougar community is always changing, most recently marked by the departure of Sandy Martin and Ms. Catanzaro. Spending the last 19 years of her time at Vernon Hills High School as the Athletic Department Secretary, Ms. Catanzaro has impacted the school since her participation on the referendum committee that helped to build VHHS through facilitating athletic participation. Mr. McDonald described how she exceeded at doing all the little things behind the scenes to make sure student athletes would be able to participate in sports. Ms. Martin spurred the creativity of student filmmakers like myself over her years with the school. Lizzie Itell says that Ms. Martin was someone she could look up to and helped her believe in her ability to pursue film further. Christian Sardo recalls her, her patience in teaching him how to use equipment and her joy at club meetings. I myself owe a great debt of gratitude to Ms. Martin for bringing art and new skills to my high school experience and I'm incredibly appreciative for her presence within the school. As a whole, this past month has brought joy, jitters, and gratitude to students at Vernon Hills High School as Cougars hit their second semester stride. All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Hari Jun. As students have begun to settle into the groove of second semester, there has been an abundance of activities and events. Concluding the first semester, on December 22nd, Vern Hills High School Chamber Choir performed at the Rustoleum. Mr. Little spoke of the experience and added that it is so fulfilling to see students take music and synthesize all the lessons that they learned over and over again. Mr. Little said that he hoped to set a joyful and calm atmosphere and that even for a moment, a person's hectic day could have a sense of tranquility. After a successful madrigal dessert, it was a sweet end to the first semester. Time is ticking until graduation day and seniors are displaying a wide range of emotions. One of them is anxiety, concerns over completing necessary, and docu necessary documents correctly. Therefore, on Wednesday, January 18th, the CRC offered FAFSA advisor meetings, providing the seniors with an opportunity to ask any questions regarding the FAFSA. Many seniors like Abby Belson utilize this opportunity, setting appointments during their lunch slash free periods. Nelson noted that completing the FAFSA has been an intimidating process, but she was able to get her questions and concerns cleared, and that Ms. Coveney even offered an additional check-in through Zoom, which instilled a sense of comfort and confidence in her, as well as in many other seniors. On January 19th, middle school students were introduced to the various academic courses and electives offered at Fern Hills High School. Along with that, students were enticed with the various clubs that were offered. And while I spoke of choir at Vernon Hills High School, one student showed excitement saying that there were so many different things and that high school seems like a completely different world. With Vernon Hills High School students advocating for their clubs and activities, this event was a truly fantastic opportunity for middle schoolers to get a taste of what to expect in high school. And personally, it was amazing to see our community come together in one place. As juniors start to shift their focus to college, there's a lot of buzz regarding which standardized test, SAT or ACT, they will take. 
As for the students that are focused on the SAT, the ARC tutoring program has begun their SAT prep study program, providing all students with the opportunity to sharpen up their test taking skills by the help of their fellow peers. When asked, Mrs. Schwartz highlighted the role of the tutors who, quote, live out the arts we care motto and create a welcoming and lively environment. While this program does take place in the morning, there is hot chocolate and tea as an incentive, helping students be calm while approaching the long and possibly dreadful reading passages. As quickly as it started, January swiftly comes to an end. The Cougars are back full swing and there's always more to come. Thank you. Good evening. Um, over the long but necessary winter break, students united with families over ethnic and meaningful dinners as sons and daughters, cousins and granddaughters. For many, it was an important time to reconnect with loved ones that perhaps were impossible to see during the prime of COVID. Others like Junior Eunice, he embraced the time she could, she could to set new goals and spend time with family. Others like Senior Raina Hill said she simply enjoyed not having school and that it was freeing. Others still hard at work spent their mornings or afternoons at libraries trying to find their last round, trying to finish their last round of college apps. Or perhaps that was just me that did that. <laughs> Regardless, winter break is now just freshly behind us. Like, like last semester, students like senior Maricela Udiba are returning to their normal sports and academic routines, going to class, doing homework, and going to clubs. Now in our third week back, clubs and sports are, and classes are fully back to running. Just a couple weeks ago, FBLA returned from a successful area competition where nine teams and individuals got first place and 13 teams got second place. Wrestling is also returning strong and with a record-breaking number of girls on the team. Now there's around six girls participating, challenging the traditional idea that wrestling is just for males. In fact, wrestling is becoming increasingly less about gender. Junior Rishma Karchala, who is a first year wrestler, decided to adventurously try it out because, quote, where else would, would she get the chance to push people and it'd be totally fine? <laughs> Karchala said that it's a really aggressive sport, one where you may go into practice fine and leave it with two injuries, one that should be, quote, more popular for girls because it is a girl's thing. Many students and clubs are setting their sets high after a semester of several projects and assignments. In our, Lat in our Latin American Student Association Club and the Chicas and Chicos Club, they hosted a pachanga, where Hispanic and Latinx students united over authentic and ethnic foods, desserts, dances, songs, and games. Senior Jackie Gallegos, who attended the event, said, quote, it's nice. It's a way to connect with the community. You see different people you otherwise might not see. I do think it has strengthened my sense of being and who I am right now. Additionally, in the leadership in the equity leadership team, groups of students and staff are researching strategies on how to effectively engage families in our school community and how students can easily and consistently provide feedback to teachers. Thus far in the professional student learning teams and the student belonging team, they've helped to create awareness projects to shed light to different less known holidays in a microaggression workshop for all the freshmen. Lasia Karchala, one of the many freshmen who found the two day training session as very helpful, said that it gave her a deeper insight into the subtle forms of discrimination, which may, dangerous, may be dangerously masked as a joke, though it shouldn't be. In addition to the equity leadership team, there's also several other individuals who are creating new goals and new visions, especially relating to social media. Last month, I talked about how easily torn a person's self-esteem, sense of self or worth can get when they're endlessly, eagerly, and helplessly scrolling through their algorithm-created and tailored feeds. This month, I sent out another survey collecting over 80 responses and the results were concerning, but not at all shocking. Among the surveyed students, there were about 50% of students that said they feel pressured to meet a body standard, despite knowing that a lot of the images on social media are photoshopped. Additionally, about 65% of students said 
that they've wanted to gain or lose weight because they felt insecure or upset about their body. Seniors like Rebecca Broomer, who's found herself comparing to the other people and lifestyles she sees on the perfectly crafted images and fake realities online, says that she wishes the school would, quote, have more classes or courses where we learn how to take care of ourselves in self-care because that's now very trendy. There's real work that needs to be done, whether it's implementing a social media literacy class or heavier SEL implementations into classrooms. Not only will it help students, but it should also help the much broader community, which is battling all of the expectations and perfection displayed on social media. Overall, though, the school has been a place of a lot of productivity and work in the classroom and beyond in clubs, sports, and communities. Okay, good, um, good evening. Before we start, we just wanted to say in um, light of like recent national events and watching the presentation, on the behalf of all the students in D128, we really just wanted to say thank you for um, you know the diligence and dedication to our safety um, by the board, by our uh, campus security or safety teams, and just like the community, uh, because in order to take full advantage of um, you know our schools and you know in order to learn well, we have to be able to feel safe. So thank you so much for um, kind of providing that support and being dedicated to that. So. Um, the report will begin with our sports. So the cats are rolling as usual. Winter athletes in basketball, bowling, gymnastics are working hard as peak championship season approaches. Our dance team is state bound. Senior captain Liv Schiff said that um, she is super proud of how her team has grown not only in skill, but as a family. And she said, we are giving our all on the floor, not only for ourselves, but for each other. I think this is a really common te uh, theme throughout all of our sports teams, which is very awesome to see. Um, she can't wait for state because of the hours of work they've put in since the summer. Cheer has their sectional this weekend and senior Abby Hayes, although she's been injured and hasn't been able to perform, is super excited to see her team um, perform and hopefully make state. Um, in preparation for spring season, we have had open pools and open gyms for sports like lacrosse and water polo. Now, um, for just like the overall, you know, like feelings of students, seniors, um, senioritis hasn't fully set in yet, as most of us um, are still receiving our college decisions. And um, yeah, a lot of major early action results have come back. Senior Frida Montano, um, who is awaiting two more decisions, is feeling, quote, pretty good. However, she does feel a lot of external pressure from her parents, and I personally can relate to this. Um, however, to combat feelings of stress, we have a great prevention and wellness program at LHS, and one of the events that's actually coming up is tomorrow morning, which is the third annual Wildcat Summit. Um, I was actually so lucky to be able to lead, um, lead and organize this along with um, Jeanette Jenkinson, Peter and Sophie Shalafo, and Leah Chudy, who are seniors. So basically the summit is a, we have 85 participants and it's periods one through four, um, where we have senior speakers talk about uh, like how to lead healthy lives through focusing on having a healthy mind, healthy body, have healthy relationships, and learn how to have healthy discourse. And so um, this was like completely student led, and um, I think it was just really awesome that we were able we we had like the resources, um, you know, to kind of like and space to have this event but uh, we kind of had full kind of freedom and control over what we thought was most important for our fellow students to, um, to take from it. So um, I am, we are definitely very appreciative of the resources that um, students get to um, kind of, you know, pursue like the projects that, um, that we think are important. Um, for the underclassmen, especially freshmen, uh, the, after like a normal semester, last semester, as this new one begins, students are adjusting to um, their new one semester classes and they feel more at ease. Rishi Departi, a sophomore, um, switched teachers for a chem class and that took adjusting and getting used to, but the teacher is nice, so it's not that difficult. She also said that um, this semester she's a lot more put together and she's been getting more sleep and is getting better at scheduling and kind of organizing her workload which is always good to see. Um, a freshman named Grace Jackman agreed with this, noting that she now knows how to handle the retakes that our teachers have and like quiz corrections and just staying on top of everything. So I think um, students have finally gotten used to the retake policies that we have and are generally feeling positive about them. Um, 
Freshman Sophia Jackman noted that she finally knows her way around the school, which I feel like us upperclassmen kind of take for granted, but yeah, they're finally getting accustomed to that. Um, However, some freshmen don't feel this um, sentiment because a freshman that I interviewed did say that with finals over, she has less motivation this semester and feels like she doesn't have to try as hard. So speaking of finals, we have, um, we also sent out a survey and Jazzy will speak about those. Yes, so I wanted to do a deep dive into the results of this survey for LHS students. So first off, we have around the number of finals that LHS students had. So around 31% had four finals, which was roughly the average. And 29% of students actually had finals split over two days. So they would have to go to one class beforehand and then have like a couple days break and then finish up the final on another day. Um, And most students had between three and five finals. But there were still a considerable amount that had upwards of six or seven finals. And speaking to stress levels, this was definitely the most concerning part of the survey. A majority of students rated their stress about finals as an eight on a 10 point scale. And there were very few students who rated their stress um, as one to five on that same scale. So a vast majority of students were incredibly stressed about finals. Um, almost 50% of students were did say that they wish that they had more f- materials that they could have been provided with to help review for finals. And 30% did say that they wanted more days of the finals to reduce stress since having only the two period day could lead to students having upwards of four finals in one day, which is a lot to handle. Speaking to study strategies, 95% of students use past study materials to review, showing that when teachers organize review materials early on, their stress really can be reduced. And most students spent seven to nine hours studying leading up to finals. I think that I also fell in that range for sure, and so did my friends. So that was around the average. Um, and then certain opinions about in general finals. Almost 70% of students liked the final schedule this year. Like I mentioned before, there were some of those outliers, and that is something to consider, but it was a majority of students did like the way that it um, that it ran. 60% of students were actually neutral about finals. They said that it was neither a good nor a bad experience, and 40% of students were actually happy with how finals went. And some students also submitted anonymous recommendations for fi- for what we could do to change finals. So the main one that we got was about having more days for finals. We also had um, like especially having three days instead of two. So that way students were only taking um, a maximum of three finals in one day. Another interesting one was make teachers required to have a certain amount of class final exam study days to correlate to make sure that students are actually getting an accurate amount of time to study and that they know how to study for finals. Um, one student mentioned that they really liked the long lunches and that they appreciated having that time to go out and relax and also get some studying in. I remember on the day of the day, the second day of finals, sitting around with my friends at a coffee shop, just reviewing for one big final that we all had. And that was really nice to be able to do. Um, one student did mention that there should be a deadline of when teachers should stop teaching materials before the final, since some teachers were still teaching right up until the day before. So it made studying for the final difficult since it was testing them on materials that they had essentially just learned and didn't have an act, didn't have an adequate amount of time to study it. Um, and also one comment of a student said that it was unfair that some students may have had five plus finals, but other students had only like a couple finals. And one comment that I frankly agree with very strongly is that having no finals for second semester seniors with an A in the class, since that I know that's been the policy in the past, but I know that all of our final policies are under review. Some students interviewed also commented that a finals plan for AP students who take AP exams in May should be communicated to classes early on to pr- improve preparing in the class. And I can definitely echo that because I know that my experience in AP Physics C has been a bit rocky with like the on with not knowing the final schedule so i would say that that's definitely a big one another thing that happened at lhs recently was our eighth grade orientation where link crew leaders and nh and nhs volunteers welcomed eighth grade families into our school students were able to watch a presentation in the auditorium led by other students on the high school experience 
The main gym also hosted lots of clubs and sports teams to increase involvement and help students find things that they're interested in. And lots of students like Sarah and Fatima actually helped lead tours for different families and answered many questions. Another um, interesting thing that's been happening is tomorrow I will actually be um, sitting in on interviews for the spot of career and technical education chair. And I just want to say I really appreciate how LHS does care about student voices enough to invite students to sit in on these interviews and provide feedback. And I'm really looking forward to it tomorrow. And uh, I also did that last year as well for the social studies um, department chair. And I thought it was a really cool experience um, last year. Also, John Graham, which was a previous board member, was able to join me in that. And it was so cool. I was invited by Dr. K. And I just thought it was really nice seeing my voice being like, helpful and like involved so it was a really cool experience thank you so to some so clubs are starting to kick off and um junior Vanessa Zhang has started her pilot club chem cats as she wanted students to change how they felt about chemistry in the classroom and just make it more interesting and she says that um I want to bring in new people and engage them with science and really put a fun spin, spin on chemistry I really agree with that. Definitely starting to go to the club. They showed a really fun video in all the classrooms yesterday. So everyone's really excited about it. Um, February is Black History Month and LHS is doing a lot to commemorate Black activists and history in the United States. So Black History Month Museum is on February 2nd and it's being held in our library for students to come in and look at it. And um, some clubs and classes are participating by creating content to celeb celebrate Black History Month. For example, Interact, which is our community service club, and I help lead it, we're, um, we're on a mission to create pieces to shine light on Black philanthropists from our history and some people from like frats and sororities and shed light on that. And the school is also organizing a unity lunch for students in all lunch periods to show a documentary about Black history. So a lot of people are really excited for that. Student Council is currently ent entering our shine season, and shine season is when we shed light on underrepresented clubs and activities. So this year, we're incorporating shine season into our winter dance to highlight students, staff, clubs, coaches, everything. So throughout February and March, Student Council planned a shine tour. And throughout, uh, this is an initiative to encourage like classes and students to visit and attend like sports events and theater plays to support their classmates and just be in the audience and highlight their hard work and be there and show their wildcat spirit. And um, staff and departments will also be highlighted in a funny video to be presented at our assembly. So we're, we're really excited for that. So Interact, which is the volunteer club I previously mentioned, we're bringing back our chemo care bags initiative, which we do in partnership with our medical cats club. And this just shows support and love to cancer patients undergoing chemotherapy at the Northwestern Lake Forest Hospital. We just make little bags with like goodies and like fun books and things like that. And we received so many letters from patients on how our hard work brightened their days and like added so many smiles throughout the hospital. So we're excited to start that again. So Best Buddies is our LHS chapter of the National Best Buddies that creates inclusion by allowing students to be paired up with other students with disabilities to create new friendships or buddies to support each other positively. Senior Sophie Shalifa, who's on their leadership board says, we're very excited for Best Buddies Carnival to make its return after COVID. It's a great way to bring together students with disabilities throughout Lake County to celebrate and give them a glimpse into the ways we can carry out the mission of inclusion. We invite LHS staff and their families and the Lake County students with intellectual and developmental disabilities to join Best Buddies on February 11th from 11 to 1 in our main gym. There's going to be so many games, inflatables, pizza, photo booths, everyone's invited. So they're really excited about that. They're also partnering up with LASSO, which is the LHS Latin American Student Organization. And they're going to lead the LHS Best Buddies chapter into like learning how to do bachata, sorry, <laughs> merengue and salsa on Thursday. So Sophie's really excited about that. And she just thinks that partnering with other clubs and teams expands their circle of friendship and encourages new connections. And um, finally, theater. Um, so our freshman and sophomore play, which is called Puffs, is going to be happening on January, I think this weekend, January 27th or Saturday, Friday and Saturday. And the story is based on Harry Potter to delight our Harry Potter loving students. And it's managed by the um, senior Chris Montero. 
freshman Olivia Venus described the experience as super fun as someone who as someone who knew one person at first I now made so many new friends everyone is super nice and Mr. Thomas is a really great director I can vouch for that we all love Mr. Thomas he's a really cool guy and um, the winter play the rose tattoo is being put on from February 10th to the 11th and senior Bethany Klump said the play is about a Silicon woman who was left devastated after her husband's death and her relationships and finding hope of new love. She says it's so crazy. They're really excited about it. And um, senior Sosie Hagopayan will be playing Flora. And she says that preparations are going great and the play is looking amazing. So everyone's really excited. A lot of events are kick coming up. So we hope to see some of you guys there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Great job, guys. Any questions for our student board reps? Okay, thanks, guys. Um, moving on. A FOIA request. We, we received one FOIA request, and it was from uh, Sydney Ryan from the Lake County Federation of Teachers. And the request was for information regarding our district's workload plans for special education staff. So they were specifically looking for worksheet formulas that we use to calculate workload for each educator, be it classroom teacher, psychologist, social worker, other things like that. Um, we, um, the responsive records were um, uh, collect collected in seven and a half hours and we emailed the response back on December 13th. So that was our one and all. Great. Thank you for taking mm -hmm. care of that request. Sounds like it took quite, it was quite a project to respond to. It was, a, yes, that, almost a full day. So that's a, a big request to make sure, um, not that we don't have those things already, but making sure that they wanted the spreadsheets that we actually use. So um, yeah, um, Kelly Hartwig did a fantastic job responding to that. Okay, request. terrific. Thank you, Kelly. Um, and now one of our favorite parts of the evening, good news. Yes, and we do have some wonderful news to share. Uh, Vernon Hills High School has been named one of 300 state finalists in the 13th annual Samsung Solve for Tomorrow competition. We're receiving a $2,500 prize package. Solve for Tomorrow is a national competition that challenges U.S. public school students in grades 6 through 12 to explore the role science, technology, engineering, and math can play in solving some of the biggest issues in their local community. The Vernon Hills Project, My Life, is an app that helps Vernon Hill students make their lives better, more connected, and more rewarding. It can help students find clubs, get the support they need, and help them organize their lives. Continued use of the app gives users free credit to be used at our DIY vending machines created in the Engineering and Advanced Computer Topics, Science Topics class. The art and logo in the apps and vending machines were supplied by the fine art students. Students in this, involved in this project include uh, senior architect, Liam Angelos, art, Grace Tao, Stephen Dong, and Alyssa Malloy as advisor. Engineering is Andrew Asunchuk and Brian Miller as the advisor. And for technology, Dimitri Shore, Rahil Seth, and Ad Adam Lucan as advisor. So again, wonderful things going on in the area of STEM. Fantastic. Um, we also have two groups that have been recognized. First, the Libertyville High School students who are named as December True Wildcats, Danielle Maraca, Julia Bennett, Cole Karazekos, Katrina Christophilus, Scott Creel, Grace Backcheck, Kendall O'Brien, and Theodore Smith. And in a similar group, we have Cougar Class Act Awards going to the following students. Kevin Batista, Hannah Bush, Yancy Lim, Gabrielle Sardo, Willow Bartlett, Sarah Besser, Annette Doherty, Ju Jason DeVita, Tanner Papernick, Aaron Griffin, Jeffrey Brahms, Kwame Ray, Jenna Sahel, and Harry Ostrom. And finally, our our uh, last bit of good news is to remind all of the people in the library here, as well as all of the people listening in, that the D128 Foundation is hosting its fourth annual D128 Day of Giving. 
Um, and um, it will be starting this coming week. Uh, 128 is on a Saturday. So the foundation decided to have it start and span three days. So Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Um, the annual campaign showcases the work that has been done by the foundation, including daring innovation grants to support, um, again, exemplary teacher innovations, um, money for students in need, as well as recognition for the um, Alumni Achievement Awards. Please help our foundation meet its goal of $12,800 on 128 um, during the campaign that will take place. Um, it will be an online um, opportunity. Um, uh, Mary and many of the people on the foundation will have lots of videos being shown, lots of uh, live shots, and you know, it just it'll be a very exciting uh, couple of days. So. Hopefully so please, we'll meet our target. And please follow the foundation on all the social networks that yes. Mary does such a great job of donating her time to support. Mm -hmm. And that's all. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. So we'll be looking for ways to give to the foundation who supports the Innovation Grants and Students in Need Fund through that day of giving mm -hmm. this Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And we can find those links all on social media. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Fantastic. Then that brings us to uh, number three on the agenda, our consent vote agenda. I'm looking for a motion to approve. So moved. Rooney, so moved. That's in second. Thank you. Any discussion? Okay, roll call, please. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Polkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. The consent vote agenda is approved. Moving on to item four, discussion. Uh, first, we'll start with board policies. This is the second set that includes sections six and seven for our first reading that we discussed in committee. Are there any questions on this Second set. So this is the set for section six and seven that we reviewed at the last um, program and policy meeting. I do have a little. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, as I was reading through the policies in 650, it does, it's about the food plan. And it asks if we have an unused food plan. And I was wondering, is that a part of our contract with Quest? And if so board policy 650 that's school wellness right. and, the and section i just had it in mm -hmm. my notes that, that we would ensure that there is a school uh now I have to find it. page two page two unused. halfway down under unused food sharing plans there it is thank you mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll have to, we'll have to talk uh, to Quest, and and it also says collaboration with the local health department. So let us, I can get back to you on that one. Great. As a discussion for first reading, that's a good catch, and we will yeah. uh, we'll bring that back for further discussion. Yeah, these these will be discussed again at committee mm -hmm. next month, and then up for a second reading and adoption next board meeting in the February. So we have some time. Any other questions about this first reading that we discussed in committee? Okay, moving on to the strategic plan financial projections. Sure. Um, Dan prepared this agenda item, but I just wanted to note that this is in response to a wonderful conversation that we had at the PNP meeting about some of the action plans that are coming out of the strategic plan and the board's request to have more of a complete picture of some of the expenses so they don't feel that things are coming at them one at a time. Mm -hmm. So our team rolled up our sleeves and made sure that we pulled together all of the action plans and Dan, Dan put it together in a very useful series of tables. So I'll turn it over to Dan and thank him for that work. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I just probably brought the data together, the whole DLT really added all the information there from the different strand leaders or the, the leaders for the different goal areas. 
Um, <clears throat> so I, what this is a, an attempt to do is to give you as full of a picture as we can of what else um, and when regarding the strategic plan. And so we walk through each of the objectives. And so there's, uh, there's summary report levels there that shows you each objective and just the foreseeable caught the best sense that we have uh, over the next five years. Um, I would remind that these are estimates and just because something's in a very particular year doesn't mean it's absolutely gonna happen in the year, we don't really know, um, but that's our best guess based on right now. Um, and so then even beyond the strategic plan, one of the questions of like, okay, well, what else beyond the strategic plan? We did our best guess to try to give you a sense of other things that we're aware of that are on the radar over the next five years um, that are important to take into context as well. Um, mm -hmm. I would say the the one thing that probably was the weirdest looking one is the capital needs that are listed there. Um, that that's just meant to be a a snapshot of what my best guess is for what are probably going to be the top four or five projects that eventually come out of prioritization um, to give you a sense that like all right these are some operational things but then this capital needs thing is a is a one time thing that's going to come up in the next uh, five years for sure. So. So the 13 million is not for strategic planning. No, and it's, <laughs> that is capital it's improvement cap estimates. <laughs> called other very intentionally. So you're not going to find it mixed in with that. Um, but yeah, so there, and there's a few other things that are listed there that are on our radar as well. Uh, Can you give us an example of what a couple of those things might be? Oh, uh, when you, which couple of things? Uh, and like that 13 project? million, the capital project. Uh, yeah, so um, you have, I believe, a detail report that'll that'll give you an idea. No, oh yeah, so mm -hmm. yeah, you'll have a detail report. So um, this would include like uh, cafeteria, science labs, library, right. things like that. So that's a sense. Stuff we've been talking about already. Stuff we've yes. been talking about that we're not, we're not done going through this prioritization process, but once we are, I would be surprised if some of these things aren't on the top of the list. Mm -hmm. So Dan, I, can I ask a question? Uh, as we're looking at these figures, many of the figures are, th I mean, I, the way I understood it is we are kind of allocating things we have already spent. I mean, we've already, always had a PD budget. We've yeah. always had a workshop budget and a materials budget. So are these new costs or are these costs that we would have spent in general, but now we're allocating it under one of the prongs of our strategic plan? That is a great question. Um, and that is one that um, is hard for me to specifically answer. There are some costs in here that we already are spending, but it'll just get diverted. So I think a lot of times when you see um, meetings with subs and things like that, we have subs now. Uh, and just instead of them meeting in action planning for the strategic plan, they're going to be different people are going to be meeting to do the action plan. Um, and there might be different people. So um, there definitely are some costs that overlap with something we already spend, uh, but a number of these things are in addition as well. So it, it, it'd be difficult for me to parse out exactly what would be additional um, versus what is just a reallocation of something we already spend. Was your question just to be clear? Well, I think it's, yeah, for for the numbers that we're seeing, I mean, like the capital output, the 13 million is this included in the typical four million that we spend every summer? This, I mean, these are. Yeah. That would not be no. Yeah. Okay, so these are new. Yeah. I, okay. That and when you're talking about the other category, but in a lot of the the detail for the different the three the three goal areas for the strategic plan. A lot, uh, depending, on, especially when you're talking the the cells with the bigger numbers in them, those are those are new. Okay. Um, I saw it also as a mix, but like when mm -hmm. I saw the PD numbers and the technology numbers, especially the PD and the materials, these are things that we would have yes. bought anyway. Mm -hmm. We are just allocating them under whatever prong they fit in our plan. For some of them, yes, but for some, for some of them, probably not. I th I think it's a mixture, mm -hmm. but that's my that's my best that's my best sense. Mm -hmm. I think. We already have a very mm -hmm. vibrant professional learning program for our teachers, and there's only so much time in a day or in a school year. And so by saying these are our three goal areas, it's going to place a priority on 
wellness and relationship building with students and equity issues. And we've had those before, but this allows us to get even more focused. Um, so I do think for these three goal areas, much of the PD is going to be a shift in focus um, and a refinement. Um, I remember when the equity coordinators um, gave their presentation back in early January, they talked about wanting to have that whole continuum of professional learning for our staff and that it's going to take a whole year <laughs> to develop that so that at any entry point, I can be a beginner, uh, um, uh, have some moderate knowledge of, of equity issues or be very advanced. And we will still have learning opportunities to move our staff forward. Um, so again, I think it's more that refining and focusing um, rather than uh, brand new professional learning. So this gives us a picture of both um, expenses that we would expect to budget normally, as well as new expenses associated with the strategic plan. It's a combination trying to give us an overview so that we have a handle on the big picture, mm -hmm. which um, I echo Dr. Herman's sentiments. I appreciate you putting that together, Dan. Um, I realize that that can't be an exact science, but giving us Idea. Some kind of tool to have an idea of what's coming down the pipeline. I especially appreciated, I noted that the biggest expense between now and um, fiscal year 27 would be the staffing for the ex Explore Multiple Paths. And when I look at the other goals, I can see some of their expenses, but they don't include additional staff. And that's a very helpful thing to see in combination with the capital improvements that we also have to make to keep our facilities safe and modern. So this is this is a helpful um, amalgamation mm -hmm. of all of those things, both things that we would normally budget and expect to spend mm -hmm. as well as new mm -hmm. expenditures to support the strategic plan. The explore multiple paths um, number seems to jump significantly fiscal year 26, 27. Can you just share the vision of what will happen there as far as where those numbers were coming from when you were sitting and looking at? Yeah. So um, some of, some of that comes from um, in the, in the objective for the explore multiple paths, there was uh, the district director role that was talked about in committee and it on the Jennifer mm -hmm. tonight. Um, in addition to that, <clears throat> in the more detail in the objectives and further on um, there was a, there was uh, part of the action plan from the committee is to look at building level coordinators for that level for that area as well. And so that's what you're seeing out in fiscal year 26 and 27. But again, those are, that's a long time from now. Those are estimates. And even I, if I recall correctly, part of uh, what Dr. Sanchez mentioned at a previous meeting was part of the role of this director is to Look at all of this and evaluate this. So none, none of none of that is particularly set in stone, but that that is that is what I was trying to accurately reflect. What is yeah. what is shown in the action plans, and so that 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 would essentially would what those numbers mean is mm -hmm. one building person in twenty six, and then two to, so one one added in twenty six as a building person, and then another one added in twenty seven okay. to have two one at each building. So that that's what those numbers changing are. Thank you. I appreciate that. And again, I think that goes to implementing a successful program will grow that much and needing um, people to oversee some of the job shadowings and other things like that. So it would be dependent on student enrollment and student growth of the program. Um, I had one question. Um, last time we talked, we saw your presentation from Dr. Sanchez about the English learner requirements and how we might think that might grow over time. Is that cost of all of that factored in here? Um, we, we believe that that's included under other initiatives under the Yale program, that there would be a half-time position for the next two years and then potentially could grow to a full-time after two years, but that still is a bit unknown for us as well. That's included here, mm -hmm. yes. Because in that that's... other, it's not okay. included in those goal areas. It's not part of those three goal areas. Yep. It's included under other. Yeah, because that might be one that we don't have 
a choice but to do right. so yeah that's that's a line item that's yeah. included for um all five of the projected years What other questions do we have about the uh, strategic plan financial projections? Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to the fiscal year 23 financials mid-year review. Hi. Um, well, we are past halfway through the fiscal year of 23. And so uh, what I wanna do is just briefly give you a sense of how is the fiscal year progressing? Um, so halfway through the year, so ideally, most things would, should be about maybe halfway received or halfway spent. Um, so I want to give you a, a sense of what that is. I'm going to really just hit a few highlights that are really the any major differences. The first one is CPPRT. Um, so that is corporate personal property replacement taxes. That is essentially a percentage of taxes that we get from the De Illinois Department of Revenue that is based on income from companies and we get a percentage of that mm -hmm. last fiscal year we received more than twice the amount that we have ever received ever and so then the big question was was that an outlier or is that setting a new bar none of the business managers really knew and so we were we wanted to be conservative and we're nervous to assume that we're going to get twice as much again um, and so we ended up, we ended up uh, assuming a lower number. Well, lo and behold, uh, in August, we were notified that we we're going to, we're going to get even more than we got last year. And so that means that that budget is off by $1.2 million. Hmm. So it is a lot of money. And even what we budgeted this year is, would have been the second highest we have ever received. Uh, so this is a bit of an anomaly and it'll be important for us to try to understand uh, this going forward. It's not supposed to be this volatile. Uh, that's not usually what happens with this. It's There's some volatility with ec the economy. So then if if the economy is heading towards a recession, what will that mean for the future? We don't really know. But what is very likely to happen is that we will end up with 1.2 more, 1.2 million more than what we budgeted. And Dan, can I ask, I know because some of the funds that we receive, um, have specified things we can spend them on. But my understanding is that's not the case for CPPRT. We can choose what to do with those funds, correct? That That is true for almost all of the money. There's a small percentage of the money that has to go into our IMRF Social Security Fund. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, there's no restrictions on the money. So the vast majority of the money, we're talking 98, 99% of the money, there is no restriction. Right. So we can spend it, we can save it, we can invest it, we could use it for operating expenses, that's to our discretion. Thank that's you. Correct. Got it. But just to clarify, it's not money we can depend on every year. Um, it, 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 it is money we depend on every year. The question is, in this, is how much. In this increase. Yeah, yeah this, this increase is, I, I would say it is unwise to assume that you're going to get okay. this much money every year. Um, for planning purposes. Correct. Mm -hmm. I, I, wouldn't want to I wouldn't want to depend all on this money. Yeah. Um, because it, the volatility is too extreme. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so for ongoing expenses, it's too volatile to plan. Yeah. So it, that'll be an important thing. So when uh, next next month, when we're talking long term financial projections, it'll be really important. That's a really important number. Like, what are we what are we assuming is going to happen with CPPRT? Because that that's really a, a big number. Well, relatively speaking. Um, so that's one thing on the revenue side. Another one that you need to be aware of is interest income. Uh, rates have been going up and we have already received more than I budgeted for for the fiscal year um, for interest income. So um, just to give it so and and I, I gave you a chart of the history to show you there's quite volatility in interest income because it's it's largely based on um, the the market, the market rates. And so uh, we are in a very high period of rates. We are December was the highest interest rate of our portfolio that we've had since I've been here. Um, and we've been tracking this stuff, so um, it's significant. So my best guess right now is if the trend continues, we'll probably end up about a million over budget on the on that for interest income. Um, the other, so I, I, that I really would say are the the major differences on the revenue side. Um, on the expenditure side, um, the what I, I think what I would 
level on is the important differences is teacher salaries. Uh, so teacher salaries is the largest line item in your budget. Um, uh, right now, we are trending towards being over budget on teacher salaries by about $280,000. Um, the biggest reason for that um, is uh, drivers out overloads that the board is aware of. Um, other overloads that were, that was additional staffing that we added after the school year had started. So think of the EL overloads that we, we've talked about in a couple meetings, Those that's an example of that. And then one was an error that we made on one particular teacher. We just misbudgeted their salary by a whole lot of money. The teacher's getting paid accurately, but we just, that person, wrong number by a lot. And so that was an $85,000 um, error on the, on the budget for teacher salary. So all those together is we're gonna be about over budget on teacher salaries, $280,000, which is not, not normal. We're usually very, very close on teacher salaries. On the other hand, ESP salaries is trending towards being under budget by, oddly enough, another 280,000. So those are seemingly offsetting each other. Um, that's, the primar that's primarily due to unfilled positions or open positions or somebody resigning and bringing somebody in that, or somebody retiring and somebody coming in uh, less, than the, less than the other person was paid. Um, or, or we would have budgeted for a position to be the whole year, but they didn't start maybe until a couple months into the school year. Uh, we still have some unfilled positions in the district as well. I don't think every single position we have is filled. Uh, and so based on that trend, that's where it looks like it's heading. Um, the other one is substitutes. Um, this is This continues to be an area that is experiencing exponential growth in terms of of spending. Um, so we're we're still experiencing absences uh, for sickness, COVID. We're still um, the 60 day. Uh, leave policy is impacting that. Uh, meetings, strategic planning meetings, those are subbed out for committee meetings, things like that, um, because there's not other time to do it. And so all of those things are adding in uh, to subs. So subs right now are trending, um, are trending about 150 to 250,000 more uh, than what we budgeted, um, which would have been if that's true, then that's the most this district has ever spent on substitute teachers. Uh, so that's a significant, that, that's probably the fastest growing expenditure category uh, in our district. Um, that's something that we, we need to pay some closer attention to and understand a little bit more. Um, everything else I would say uh, is, is overall trending as expected. Um, this was a year that um, we knew was gonna be tighter. It's a deficit of 1.9 million. And so um, I think we have a lot of departments that are feeling the tightness of that. Um, and so we're trying to watch that closely and things come up, that things break that we have to pay for that we didn't expect to. So those are ongoing daily, weekly conversations trying to make sure we meet the needs of our departments. Um, so when you put it all together, our budget had a deficit of, operating deficit of $1.9 million. Um, Part of the reason for that was our change in accounting for property taxes. So we knew this was going to happen. We knew this was going to be a one-year thing. However, based on the change in CPPRT and interest income, um, I'm anticipating us, we, we, I think we're trending closer to a small surplus of maybe a few hundred thousand. So if you take the $1.9 million deficit and think, all right, now 1.2 million up from CPPRT, and then another million up from, um, interest income, and then down a little bit because salaries are trending a bit over, um, you're, you're really close to probably a couple hundred thousand over. So, uh, it's, so that, that's good news, right? Um, you know, the other part of me is like, I, I want to be accurate. And so part of that to me feels like a little bit of bad news too. But I think the good news is things are, we're, we're, things are all overall on the revenue side looking better than we thought. Expenditures are just a little bit worse than we thought, but I think I think we'll be fine. I think the big thing that I'm going to watch for is if we are trending close, close to over to overspending our entire budget. That's something that kind of think about Congress and everything. They don't really have the legal authorization to spend more than what's appropriated. We have a similar thing here. So I'll keep watching that as the year gets closer. Uh, but for right now, right now, I think we'll probably be okay. Is my sense. Dan, do you feel like a lot of districts are facing that situation with substitute costs because of absences and COVID and things like that? Is uh, that... Yes, uh, yeah, I mean, the 
I'm just trying to get it. It's not, it's not just us. It's the situation, a residual situation from COVID that in hopefully will. For sure. I think other districts are doing that. I mean, there's, there's just a few things that are unique to us that are affecting us, the parent, um, but there are common parent, things that yeah. many districts yeah. are, that many districts are dealing with. Okay. And maybe other illness too. There's a lot of mm -hmm. things going around this mm -hmm. winter that yeah, there are caused, uh, a lot of people. Yeah. 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 And I yeah. think, you know, the one thing I hear is, you know, before you power through and you come to school and, you right. know, you have sick days and, and, you know, people will take those sick days. So, you know, there are, you know, times that I, I see that our absences are, you know, a little higher than normal. And, and then with the sub substitute teaching shortage, um, sometimes we are doing internal substitution and internal substitution using our own teachers is more expensive than bringing in somebody from the outside all day. Um, so hopefully when the weather warms up, we'll see. Yeah. And we appreciate teachers not coming to school sick, and we do not want to promote a culture where people feel that they need to come to work sick. That's what sick days are for. And we want our staff to do what they have to do to take care of themselves. On the topic of substitutes, is our rate this year, substitute rate for external subs, similar to what it was last year? We increased it. Um, I think last year was the year we increased it a little bit. Um, and we haven't gotten pushback from our subs that we're, you know, below, we are below some other schools, but then we're higher than some schools around us. Um, I think we're right there in the market. Our substitutes tend to um, really stay at our schools. Like they don't, a lot of substitutes, they don't travel very far, you know? Um, and so I haven't, you know, heard that we're falling rapidly behind other schools. I also don't want to get into where I know there are certain pockets in the county that they, people just schools raise it and the next school raises it and then they're kind of getting into a war and I don't want to do that and put district 70 or 68 or 73 that we're raising our rates higher and then their substitutes are, aren't going there. So I, I think we're in a good place and we've picked up um, some more substitute teachers have signed on in the last uh, month. So. <laughs> And pay is not the only reason a substitute teacher will work in a particular building. It's how we make them feel when they're here. Correct. Correct. It's what yeah. kind of supports we give them. Yeah, five dollar difference, you know, is not the reason that they may stay with us, um, you know, for the day. It's that you know the feedback I get from our substitutes is they enjoy coming into our buildings, they feel welcomed by our staff, they feel welcomed by our students, they feel safe, um, and we have a lot of returning substitutes, you know. Have you noticed any difference since the legislation has changed about sub requirements? Um, we picked up a, a you know, I, I mean, I think we picked up some more subs, mm -hmm. a few more. Um, it's still not as many as it was, I would say, six years ago, the number, uh, you know, uh, of people there. And part of that, again, at the trickle down effect, you have less educators, you know. Um, there's less teachers, full-time teachers available. Um, and so that's going to affect your substitute teachers and that's gonna affect the amount of uh, also staff for your support personnel. Mm -hmm. So, you know, really kind of when you look at it, when you have less people getting into education, that affects everything else in the schools, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. What other questions do we have? Okay, thank you again for compiling that mid-year review for us. Um, we are now to items for action. Um, and we begin with items that came out of the PMP committee. So I will turn it over to Jim. Uh, the first on the action item here is actually just a uh, um, review of the closed session minutes. So uh, this is a, a, a typical thing that we do every, um, <laughs> is it every six months we have to review these. Um, and determine if we're going to keep them as uh, confidential, retain them as confidential, which we usually do. So uh, in this case, we have a, a list of uh, closed session minutes that uh, uh, is a recommendation to re have them remain closed. So, um, Hessel, I would like to move that the need for confidentiality still exists for all current closed session minutes and those listed below and all shall remain in the closed file. Carmichael, second. Any questions or comments? Roll call, please. Benjamin. I'm sorry, Sonal, did you have a question or comment? Okay. 
Oh, no, that's right. Um, I. Uh, Carmichael. I. Drumkey. I. Hessel. I. Kolkarni. I. Rooney. I. Batson. I. Motion passes. Uh, second item on the list here is uh, board policies. This is a uh, an initial set that we've already had the first reading. Uh, we earlier in the this evening we had a first reading for a second set. This is a first set that we had. There's about 17 policies here. Um, many of them are are updates because of um, legal references and things. But there were a few that were um, um, pretty drastically changed. But these have been reviewed in two committees plus the first reading at last month's uh, board meeting. So. Uh, these are up for um, second reading and adoption. So we can have a motion to adopt these policies. Drumkey moved to approve the 17 board policy updated as listed. Benjamin, second. Okay. Any further questions or comments? Were there any other changes uh, between our last meeting and this meeting? No, there were not. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Okay, roll call, please. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kolkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. <laughs> Aye. Okay, motion passes. We have um, an item here for employment of employees. These came in since our committee meeting. Um, so they're they're listed there and uh, just need a, a motion to uh, to accept these uh, recommendations. Carmichael, move to approve the employment items listed that occurred after the PMP committee meeting. Rooney, second. Okay, any questions or comments? Um, I just wanted to comment. It's really nice to see internal people or people that are returning to us. I know Denise Fuentes is an existing employee um, from the Vernon Hills CRC who's take, assuming a new role. Is that correct? She, she, she was here um, in our CRC and she uh, left. Um, to take another position at a college, and she is returning to it. And we are very happy to see returning employees, both for Denise and Kyle Harwin, who was um, an accounting honors teacher that my son had, really enjoyed him. He left to pursue another job and also came back to Vernon Hills High School. So I think that says a lot when we have people leave Vernon Hills High School and come back um, because it's a great place to work. So thanks, John, and to your team for creating an environment where employees uh, – may set out for greener pastures and do tend to come back. So, and I, um, I like to recognize we do have a resignation on there of Margaret Nicholson. Um, she is taking a position as a science department chair in Maine Township. So uh, congratulations, congratulations to, yeah. to Maggie on taking that position. We are sad to see her leave Libertyville High School, but we are happy for her that she is taking on a leadership position. Okay. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay, roll call, please. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kolkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Okay, motion passes. Um, we have a uh, request for a director of college and career readiness. Um, this, again, was discussed in committee. Um, Dr. Sanchez, do you have any quick background you want to? present here yes um in addition to the board memo Bo is going to help me up and he's going to put uh i promise it's only four slides um that i put together around the legal requirements that we have to comply uh, with from the illinois state board of education you can go to the next one Bo. thank you so the first one covers um the career pathway legislation which was signed into law in may of this year um and so it requires that we have at least one endorsement area beginning with the high school graduating class of 2027. So that is our incoming freshmen. Um, and um, subsequently, we have to have an additional endorsement plan by 2029 and a third one by 2031. Um, and we have to submit an application by July 1st of 2025. Um, and then in the next slide, um, you'll see what the the recommended path for learning is. And so you see how it starts uh, with at least two career exploration activities or one intense experience at our freshman and sophomore level. Unfortunately, we don't have a path established, so our incoming freshmen will not have this experience at the ninth grade level. So we, were, we will have to squeeze that in to their sophomore level so that we can meet the deadline of 
the graduating class of 2027 having had the opportunity to have one career pathway to choose from. Um, and then we look at the requirements for um, junior and senior year, which is when we um, have to have the 60 hours of um, an internship or an apprenticeship or um, just on the job experiences, as well as the team-based challenges that we still have to develop. Um, so we're a little behind in terms of meeting these um, deadlines and expectations. Um, and then the next one, uh, Bo, is the legal requirements around the PACE framework. So this is um, an instructional framework that we have to um, use and we have to have a plan set in place um, to begin implementation in the 2025-2026 school year. So we'll have two school years to get ready for the impl implementation and use of this uh, PACE framework. It's kind of like a standards for college and career exploration. Um, and the, yeah. the activities that our current career development centers don't meet these requirements, correct? No, we have one global capstone and that's for the, the scholar glo mm -hmm. global capstone. We, we have to develop them. Yeah. Develop more, is that what you're saying? Yeah, so the global capstone does not count as a, a college and career um, pathway. Okay. Mm -hmm. A, a pathway is like a series of, of courses leading to specific knowledge in a certain career path, as I understand it. Yes. So, for instance, um, I'll give you the example of the district I, I live in, Woodstock, Illinois. They have a teacher education career pathway. And so they developed a partnership with McHenry Community College. And a lot of the teachers um, that are teaching at the high school um, are able to teach dual credit classes. So by the time the kids graduate as seniors, they've completed their associates. And then there's a partnership with Aurora University who happens to have a campus in Woodstock. So the, the kids will then transition into Aurora University and they can um, finish their bachelor's in less than four years and finish the student teaching usually by the third year. Um, and so they are well on their way to being teachers by the time they graduate high school. And it, what a phenomenal pipeline for teachers, which we desperately need. Yes, they, they, <laughs> they did a good job. Um, and so it is those experiences. So for instance, the 60 cumulative hours of on the job training, um, we would have to develop partnerships with local organizations to make sure that we have those um, for students. Um, so we, we have some work to do. Those are the endorsements that are referred to in the pathway endorsements. The, yes. In the law. Okay. Just for anyone, including myself, who's listening that didn't quite understand what that meant. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, in addition to the presentation in the board memo, I included um, some, of, I addressed some of the questions that you, um, you all presented at the PMP meeting, uh, which was what are our other surrounding districts doing and in terms of um, administration support and as you can see, they all have uh, district level administrators. The only, um, the one that doesn't is the Grays Lake High School. They have one CTE department chair. Um, and so when I um, spoke to, 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 to Gina, it, 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 she does the job of a director, but it's not called that. And so she doesn't have um, department chair responsibilities like evaluating the teachers or um, those types of things. And then this year they added a career exploration and internship coordinator who only does the, the whose sole responsibility is to focus on those um, on the job experiences for students. Um, I also added a category that addresses the job responsibilities that are new that are that we are currently not um, not addressing, and then the ones that our current CT department chairs do do. Okay. Um, um, any questions, comments on that? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm looking at the the jo jo job description. Do do these other districts have metrics around s some of this, like some of their positions? Meaning, how many companies do they reach out to? How often they're expected to present these opportunities? Things like that. I mean. Maybe I'm I'm thinking of it in terms of private company, but 
So you're just wondering how, how to measure the success of right. this person. How are we going to measure the how many students, how many tiers, right. uh, how many pathways, um, right. what, what are the metrics? And there are milestones. Like after the first year, where are we? After the second year, where are we? Because you're not going to do it all at once. Mm -hmm. So are there right. milestone metrics? By the sure. first year, will we have this accomplished? By the next year, will we have this accomplished? Right. So, so the, the plan is that we have to meet the endorsed pathway endorsement guidelines. So by 2027, we have to make sure we do have one established pathway. So that's a metric. Okay. Making sure that we have two for the class of 2029 making sure we have three for the graduating class of 2031. So that doesn't mean that we start them in 2029. That means for the students that will be graduating that year. So for instance, the graduating class of 2027 means next year's freshmen. So we have to have some of this work um, started way before the you know, 2029 year or the 2031 year um, to make sure that like the incoming freshmen have one pathway to to choose from and then also like monitoring enrollment that was one on the strategic plan update is we we'll want to make sure that the enrollment in, is growing in each of the, in, in each of these programs I, I think that one of the things that would be helpful is bryant and yesenia work collaboratively and drew from existing job descriptions from these other schools so there it's very much the best of the language that's used in the other schools. Um, I think I appreciate that kind of job description that you're referring to. Unfortunately, that's not a common practice in education, right? It's now. not a common practice in corporate either to include metrics by which you're going to be measured in a, in a job description. But I understand the mm -hmm. question, even if it's not part of the job description, once you read through it, right. one how does we... wonder, how are we going to judge? How are you going to judge? How are you going to judge? if this person is successful in the role. And I would say the thing that I brought up in committee that I'm still really stuck on, and I'd like to hear um, both Dr. Herman and Dr. Sanchez comment on, I am not okay with somebody that does not have direct experience developing and implementing and monitoring a program like this. I, I have so much respect for the people in our building who might be have transferable skills for this role. But I'm going to have a really hard time approving a contract for somebody who does not have direct job experience in a high school setting developing these programs. And you showed us a list where we have many peer districts where we have have we are really behind many schools that are offering fabulous programs for all of their students. Um, and, and I'm sorry that we don't have anything um, quite to that level yet, but we should be able to find someone that has experience. And I would ask that that be prioritized when um, when we do get to the point where we're looking for candidates. I, I, I'm not gonna have a, an easy time approving the contract for somebody that does not have direct experience doing this job. Yeah, so, so we've listed the CTE endorsement as preferred, but we can make it a requirement. I, I think what I'm looking for goes Years beyond that. experience it, yeah it, not the endorsement yeah mm -hmm. okay and I, I think you know when we look at candidate for any position um you look at the big picture the whole picture of that candidate so you look at their their skill set and what they've done in the past and, and experience also you know are, do they have the ability to also improve on what they're we, we don't want somebody to come in and just you know not i guess get better into that role so somebody that can grow into that role but there are other schools that have, um, you know, this position. Um, some of them have two positions and maybe that, you know, the person that they have in, you know, their role of the, um, I'm just kind of looking like a career expo exploration specialist who's maybe below their director at a mm -hmm. school. That might be somebody that, you know, has experience and is working and that we may be able to, you know, draw to, you know, our, our school. So we will definitely, you know, reach out to all of our contacts um, and look at, you know, um, people with experience and take all of that, you know, into consideration. And you do a phenomenal job of sourcing. And as somebody who has a background in HR, I understand what you're talking about, where you want someone to be able to level up and grow into the role. Um, there have been other contracts for administrators that we have proved or approved or somebody has transferable skills, but has not worked in the role mm -hmm. that they have been hired for here in the district. 
this is not one of those roles where I would be inclined to approve a contract for somebody who doesn't have direct experience, even if it's not at the director level, mm -hmm. working on the development and implementation and monitoring of this type of program at the high school level. Yes, I, I agree because this is setting up something very foundational, you know, will have a long lasting impact. So, so I think that, and to kind of address what you were saying, um, Casey, maybe part of your job responsibilities, you need to add that this person is going to develop metrics and monitoring and to ensure that it's tracking to what we expect it to. That's, you know, you see that as part of job responsibilities. So I do have a question because it's changing the framework of how I'm seeing this. Are you saying now that every high school in Illinois will not be in compliance with ISBE unless they have some kind of a role like this by their graduating class 2027? It's, it's, it's not the role is that we have to have these career pathway endorsement programs. Yes, so it's not it's not the role, but that we, we must have the pathways and they have to create some kind of a program that will offer these pathways. Yep. Someone in an organization needs to be responsible for that task. Right. And and I think we're all in. I know myself, I am committed to seeing this uh, happen. And this has been a part of, you know, what our plan is. But I also. And I respect the recommendations that were made by the committee that did this deep dive that is included with teachers and different stakeholders. I, I respect all that and I want to honor that, but I feel that I also want to respect the climate, the climate and culture survey that we've received that has said to us, said, we have had a lot of change in a very short time. And this is another huge change. And we have, I feel like we are going from zero to 100 in one year when we've kind of given ourselves over five years to see us be at 100. I also see this as more top down as opposed to grassroots up. I mean, that's kind of where I was coming from and it might be too simplistic, but I was hoping that we could see some development from the bottom up to an enough buy-in and enough success that we go, hey, wait a minute, this program is working enough. Now we do need a director. It's not that I am opposed to this position, but I think we have moved so fast so quickly. We have not given ourselves a, a breath with a director of equity and, you know, to say, hey, wait a minute, let's see what we can develop on our own with the resources that we have to, to need this, to justify this. Can I, uh, maybe I'll throw a couple of comments. Having lived through this from the doing this where I work and having created a director position and all this kind of thing um, already. Um, I think a, a couple of comments. One is we're all, we're behind the curve. We have it is um, requirements by the state to have these programs in place and we're not there and we need to have them in place very quickly. So if we're moving quickly, I think we're moving quickly because we're being pushed to move quickly. And the fact that we haven't had enough resources to focus on this program has put us in this situation. So I think it's it's not, and, and you know, you can look back and hindsight's always twenty twenty. But we're in this situation now, and I think there's there's uh, you know these are not simple programs. These are not things that you just piece together. These are have requirements by the state, and so I think there's two things at play. One is you know, the state is really pushing to have these things in place starting in the fall um, for our, those freshmen coming in in the fall. The other piece of this is a major component of our strategic plan is multiple uh, pathways, multiple, really to trying to encourage our students to, to look at multiple pathways as they progress through our district and as they progress into life uh, and what they do after school. So I think there's there's a lot of um, energy <laughs> coming together that need, you know, that's going to push this program forward. Some of them are absolute requirements that we have to meet. And I think there's just a lot of work there. And uh, I think it would be, um, in my opinion, it would be short-sighted to not give it the resources we need to jumpstart this thing quickly. Um, that we're now, you know, behind all our area 
other area schools and will put us in a position where we're playing catch up for for a while and i just don't think it's um it's wise to shortchange that process at this point in time and i i think your concern is a good one i would love to hear um the administration's take on whether or not we do have um the ability to use our existing resources to develop the programs that we're being asked to pro to develop I'll start, and then I know Yesenia has worked very close with both CTE um, programs. Because I guess we, we have, just to clarify for the public, anybody who might be watching, we do have CTE, full-time full -time CTE positions at both buildings? Well, they're department chair, so they teach two classes, and they also oversee a group of teachers. Got it. And um, compliance grants and other things like that that go along with the CTE program. One of the things that I would describe our program as um, a very vibrant and high quality classroom based program. And so we have, we do have some very clear um, course sequences where you can go from a beginning to an advanced. What we're missing in our program that state is now requiring is that work experience and, and having kids not just um, think about an internship, but make sure that we are from freshman year, sophomore year, junior year, helping them construct that knowledge and make meaning. So whatever they do decide to do for their 60 hours, they um, we've set the stage for that to be a successful learning experience. Right now, our department chairs, um, they already participate in some of the P20 networks. They participate um, they have been advocating that we move forward with this position for many years. Um, this is something that we foreshadowed last spring when we brought other positions saying, we know this is coming. We just want to make sure we know where it might fit in the strategic plan, and then we'll bring forward the details on it. Um, so I also just want to remind people that when we were looking at our organizational structure and saying, what do we need to move forward with what we see as being expectations of the state? This was one of the positions that we had foreshadowed. So while it is, again, new, it's not something that is um, we hadn't predicted that we would need. Um, and in terms of the, um, one of the reasons why a lot of districts are finding success having it be one person at the district office is because you then have one point person for all of the businesses in your local community. Um, it can be like when you have two people, they sometimes call the same people, assume the other person's going to call that, that when you're doing community partnerships, they've said that it's, it's pretty essential that you have one point person and it actually is more efficient in our use of staff because they're building one program in terms of community-based program, it will still be the department chair's job to make sure that the coursework is aligned and that the teachers are still, you know, um, being as innovative as they ever have be. So have been, so we see this as building on the foundation that we have, but our department chairs are already working very, very hard, as are the teachers. Uh, teachers who teach in CTE have multiple preps, so it's not just one or two preparations. They're prepping for three or four different classes, usually, um, so uh, you know, the, the uh, challenges that they face already are, are quite high. Well, can, can this, I? Oh, I'm sorry, just to follow up. So yes. would hiring a district-level position like this affect the leadership opportunities at the building level then? Those people that are currently doing it in the building, is how is that going to affect their position? Um, I don't, I think we see some of the responsibilities that they currently have <laughs> shifting to this person, giving them more time. They would be working with this person. Yeah. So right now, um, uh, I think... Yesenia, you highlighted um, some of the responsibilities, let's say like Perkins grant mm -hmm. management. Um, right now, each department chair does that separately at the building. Again, it's not quite as efficient as having one person manage the grant for the whole district. So some responsibilities we would see shifting to let lighten the load on our current department chairs. But many of the things are new tasks that this person would be taking on, and they would be working very closely with our current CTE leaders. So what I wanted to add to that, if I, if I might, 
Um, there's a cultural element where we have always supported that sometimes things will be the same at both schools and sometimes they'll be different. And it's really based on what's best for students. I think this is an area where we really need to have the same opportunities available at both buildings. And having a district, one of the advantages of having a district level person is that we won't have situations like we have now, where we have Project Lead the Way available at Libertyville High School for engineering, and we don't have it at Vernon Hills High School. That's an area where it's an equity issue where all of our students need to have access to the same opportunities, and having someone like this working under Dr. Sanchez will really make sure that. The pathways that are being created, the relationships that are being created out in the community, uh, whether they're on site or virtual opportunities, are really being offered um, in an equitable way at both buildings. I'll also add this you know, we, we've talked about CTE. This is not just a CTE Correct. program, it's, it's a much broader program where the anticipation is every student has the opportunity to participate in a career pathway or maybe a multiple career pathways to really identify those things that the path that they want to take once they leave us. So it's, it's an all encompassing, you know, it could involve all our students and it's not just the CTE programs. It could be fine yeah. arts. It could be talking about the chem cats that, that the students reported on, you know, that could be come a pathway in terms of, about food science or, you know, some of those kinds of things that students are interested in. So the Echo, point there once is again, that, an educational pathway right, to have a right. pipeline for teachers. There's so right. many different, it, it really, yeah. as Jim is saying, it's, yeah. it's for So everyone. the expectation for the department chair for CTE to take on this role is not really realistic because they're just, they're working within their section, but, you know, there's a lot more to this. There's a much broader scope to what the, the career pathways can and should become. And by reporting to our um, associate superintendent for curriculum, it gives the opportunity to make sure that where the curriculum can be updated and supported in our course catalog and our graduation requirements need to really reflect the, the, the workforce of the future, um, that person is working hand in hand with you. So where the curriculum needs to be updated from being very traditional to maybe adapting to a lot more um, coding and machine learning and uh, all of this, the things that the the workforce is going to require for our students who are in the pipeline now and who are coming to us. Um, by having that person reporting to you at the district level, I think there's a lot of opportunities um, to improve at the curricular level as well as at the pathways level. I have a student that would like to, yeah, jump yeah in. please do, please do. Personally, I think that like having a pathway would be like a great investment of the time because personally for me, I was like over the past summer, I was looking for an internship, but like I couldn't really find anything that easily with the help of the school. Like the, the CRC definitely helped, but like having a pathway and like having access to hands-on experience and just getting an idea of what you're getting yourself into, I think that's really valuable, especially when you're heading on to college, mm -hmm. just seeing what what you're trying to major in like we're picking majors and we don't know what we're picking exactly so just getting an idea hands-on experience shadowing people i think it would be very valuable so i'll just add uh, a number of us attended a, an event last night and part of that event there were some some workshop sessions prior to um a, a keynote um a dinner type of thing uh, one of those sessions was uh, dr ken wallace from main township uh high school district who presented and really as, as, and I've been sort of involved in some of this in my day work uh, for well over a year uh, working with the, the administration team there. But Dr. Wallace really opened my eyes to a lot of opportunity that I didn't even realize even looking at this. Um, and it's a, it's a fascinating presentation. I'd be happy to share the link actually with, with any board member that would like to see that. But I know uh, he's, uh, Don, you were there. They were amazing. Yeah, it's just they're ten years ahead of us. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're li they are literally ten years, literally ahead ten of years us. ahead of us. And I was so inspired by what they've been able to do for their students. Not only are they letting their 
students starting in eighth grade identify different paths to explore and figure out what they like and what they don't like. For those that are going on to college, their applications really stand out because they've had some really rich experiences in addition to the rigor that their curriculum provides. And often in the field that they're interested in going into in college anyway. Right. I mean, I always saw this more, this is broader than just the technical right. education, right? right? right. This is broader. Mm -hmm. I, so when Maine, I'm just curious, since we're talking about it, when they implemented this, did they implement it with top down with the district or did they find that it was kind of grassroots and it was being successful and it, it broadened into what it is now? I believe it came out of their strategic plan. And really was, and it was a philosophical change, not just in what the career pathways are, but in how they teach. Uh, I mean, it, it's a sweeping plan. And the thing that blew me away was the agency that students felt and what it did to their learning when they're in the classroom, learning something that they now see as relevant to something that they might do in the future, it changes the paradigm that agency changes the paradigm. And I think it would be a very welcome shift as we move forward, uh, both for students and for teachers, having this, this learning environment in their classroom. As I think about our, you know, the, the, the concept of the multiple pathways and whatnot from our strategic plan, and then I see what they're doing. Had I, in my wildest dreams, had I envisioned our strategic plan being absolutely, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, beyond our expectations, we're able to accomplish everything we wanted to do. That's where they are now. That's where they are now. They, they, to... they recognize that they had a problem. They had three schools that are very, very different demographically and a, a single district. Uh, and they felt the need to address all of the concerns of all of the students. And so that led to a strategic plan that, mm -hmm. that led them to this idea that, uh, they should be gainfully employed. Like that's the goal. Mm -hmm. And how they're going to go about doing that is something that they could start thinking about as early as eighth grade. And, and then they meet a half hour a week. They built it into their mm -hmm. schedule um, so that that's part of the direction that they're going. So strategic plan is, is the answer to the question. And it was, and it again, was a big one. Because it's a multi-high school district, they did invest in one person to coordinate efforts among the campuses. Um, the other thing that I uh, just want to mention, many of the times in our district where we have started a new program, we have invested in a year of development. Most recently, the transition pathways, where we said, we want to bring these students back from CEDAW. Here's the finances that said, you know, this is financially good and it's also going to be instructionally good for our student. We hired the director a year early so that that person could hire all the teachers, get, again, all the internships and the work-related experience. So I don't see it as top-down or bottom-up. I see it as organizational. We have to have someone who has the skills and experience to build the program so we then can hire more teachers and get more experiences and things like that. So I think it's the design build rather than top down or bottom up. The question uh, regarding the candidate pool, if you have any awareness of it, just like what's out there. I know we haven't even approved to post the position or anything, but um, are, is there a network of individuals? Is there a pool of individuals that have this highly skilled, um, experienced based background that, Lisa, you so eloquently stated is is really essential, I feel, not only to our board president, but I'm I'm feeling much mm -hmm. the same, right? If we're gonna invest in this, we want it to be a top-notch thing from the get-go. Um, is it going to be a challenge to find this individual, to identify this person? Do these do these professionals exist en masse um within a potential candidate pool? That is actually a large concern of mine because whether they exist outside of the network of people who already are here in the district or not, um, you know, we, we have to make sure we're choosing the right person. So I don't know if you could shed light on that or what. I, I think, you know, in talking to my colleagues in, in human resources, I, I think it'll be a challenge. It won't be one where your, your pool will be huge um, as maybe some other positions that we, you know, typically <clears throat> may draw. So we're going to have to do some networking really. And we're going to have to do some outreach on our own. 
we may have to reach out to some people that are in positions that may not be, again, the director at their school. They may be the coordinator at their school. Um, but, you know, the schools that, you know, you have seen and that Dr. Sanchez listed, you know, they have been able to hire people and find people. Um, the other challenge, the longer we wait to hire somebody, there are other schools in our same position in the area um, in, in Lake County that, you know, are going to start posting their positions, whether it's later this year, if they haven't already, or if it's next year. And so, yeah, that pool will decrease. I mean, the one thing is when you look at District 128, we are able to attract candidates from other school districts, whether that's a unit school district or, you know, a, a, a school district, uh, maybe not in the area and attract some candidates. So, um I think we did a good job last year of attracting candidates for our four administration positions. Um, and, you know, really, when you look at a couple of them, they're not normal positions from your director of equity and inclusion. Not every school has it. Your director of data and assessment, you know, not really, you know, normal positions that every school has. There are more and more schools have those positions now. Um, and we were able to attract two good candidates for that. So I'm curious. Um... John, you served on that committee. Do you have any thoughts yeah. from the recommendations and the presentation yeah. and the I, discussion? Thanks. I appreciate what Cara was saying about this idea of, okay, so we've we've looked at some feedback relative to culture and climate. We've looked at some feedback relative to what staff have said. Is this something that needs to be a district level position? Is this something that could be organic that kind of comes from the grassroots? And I think back on how, We've done that in the past. We did that with our equity work. We had kind of in-building um, teachers who had a passion for equity and began that work. And it's built up uh, to the point where we brought Larry in as someone who could uh, help lead and foster that. We did the same thing with our instructional coaches. They started off as tech coaches. Back when we had the one-on-one -on -one initiative with the Chromebooks, they turned into uh, instructional coaches in combination with literacy coaches that were all organic grassroots uh, types of positions. We did that with our data coaches. We had a, a data team within. We built that program, and now we have a uh, district-level data person. So I think it's fair to say, could we do that again? As a building principal, I don't think so. <laughs> I think this is a new enough and unique enough uh, role. And what we're asking this person to do as jumping into a district level system right off the bat and making it kind of congruent between the two buildings. Uh, there is no one in the buildings right now, um, you could argue, that has the expertise and maybe more importantly, the time within their within their current job to be able to do this with any kind of fidelity or I think success. It, it would be a hodgepodge of trying to make things. And honestly, that's kind of what we've been limping around with this in the last couple of years. We've, we've known this is there, but it's kind of this type of thing. Like who's, who's got the time and the expertise and the, to, nobody. So I, I think this is the right time for us to, um, kind of all pull together, get someone at the district level. And trust me, I don't think this is someone who's going to just sit over at the district. This is going to have to be somebody who spends half their time in Vernon Hills, half their time at Libertyville, half their time in the community. And that's <laughs> what it's going to have. Uh, but not half their time at the district office. Right. So I, I really, I, I think that they need to be at the district level because they have some of this this work that has to be kind of umbrellaed uh, and, and congruent between the two, but I don't see it as a district, you know, working position. They'll be in the buildings uh, getting this work done. And I think it'll be important work. Well, I will just add that I'm obviously no expert, but I did attend the Lake Zurich uh, presentation when I was at the ISB conference. And Again, they're way ahead of where we are. But my sense was this cannot be a hobby job. It's got to have focus because they meet with students all the time. They help them plan things. So it, it's it's got to have some focus effort. And I, from a timeline-wise, I think we're, we should have been doing this years ago. So I think we're behind. 
Yes. One, oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, is it is it possible to at some point hear from one of these districts if we could coerce them to I thought <laughs> kindly the ask if they thing. would come talk to us about how they started their program, maybe some of the pitfalls they faced. Lisa has so a new friend. We, you know, I mean, this is this is a significant investment, and we want to, as a board, make sure that we have community buy-in on this, that, that we have teacher buy-in on this, and hearing what other, how another district successfully did that so that we can learn from some of their, you know, nuggets of wisdom might, might be very helpful. And, I, I and, couldn't agree more. And I heard from District 155 this past Friday at a meeting I was at with my HR colleagues um, and they're newer to it, um, but they, you know, have done a lot of great things. Um, I, sh I probably can get their presentation and share that with you, but we could probably, you know, figure out something to, you know, put, to put together or have somebody come yeah. and talk to us. About yeah, we have a CCR right. meeting this Friday and Lake Zurich is hosting, so I can talk to um, Zach about that. I would just like to echo uh, what Lisa said regarding the experience, because I think that's going to be very important. Um, I un Under the qualification says Illinois professional educator license with administrative endorsement. How long does that take to get? So it, 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 I guess it depends on their background and what they are. Yeah. So they're starting from scratch. They don't have any of the classes. So you're talking about a non-educator? No, no, no. They're they're an educator. I'm looking at somebody who's like uh, they're currently six fifths working at a district where they're, um, uh, excuse me, not six fifths, three fifths. They're working three fifths on doing this uh, career ed coordinating, and they're teaching two periods. So they're a classroom level person that has experience, but they might not have their Illinois professional license yet for. Um, so it all depends. Educator license. So it depends if they've, um, you know, oh, that's, working towards their master's in. in I just mean their administrative endorsement. I don't mean so under Illinois professional educator license. That just means they're a certified teacher. Yeah. The administrative endorsement is what so I mean. It depends if they've started a program with the master's. If they haven't started a program at the master's, typically you're talking a year and a half to two years. Yeah. It's a it, it's a, you know what we used to call a type seventy five. Yeah. Right. You know, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But I would I would look at it that being less important than the experience. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And if you it, had a person who would commit to getting their administrative endorsement, but they had experience, I would hire that person before I would hire somebody with no experience, but who has the administrative endorsement. Well said. I think it depends on the, whether we anticipate this person supervising certified staff. Because it, it's and at this point, they're not. They're probably not. Yeah, yeah. But I think based on what we're looking at for the future, they could be in a position to. And mm -hmm. I, I would echo your sentiments. Yeah. And I appreciate the um, question about that administrative endorsement and how long it would take, and if that really is mm -hmm. a requirement or something that somebody could gain. So, um, like in in the in the first year, somebody coming, they would in order to uh, really evaluate staff is when, when they need that. Right. Um, so let, let's say, for example, that somebody is at a, another position in a coordinator position and they're in their first year of working on their master's. Um, we're hiring them, but they have the experience, but they're working on their master's. You know, that could, we could take that into consideration and look at, and I know that has been done here in the past in in a previous position. Sure. So. We've hired, lots of schools have hired uh department chairman that don't have the certificate yet. Yeah, I think to, to your point that the focus should be on the experience in the, you know, in this, this area of, of, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the career sort of pathways, pathways mm -hmm. kind of area versus just somebody that's happens to have a, a admin endorsement and mm -hmm. teaches some class, you know, or something. I think that I think that's the point. Is and to your point, Lisa, to to really get somebody with some good experience, so they can hit the ground running and and really coordinate this well. Can I just amplify Casey's point? I I couldn't believe that the universe put me in a session with Ken Wallace from District Two Hundred Seven. What are the night, chances? I mean, 
I had not planned on attending that. And my, the session I had planned on attending got canceled. So I went there by default and again, yeah, same thing. It's like, I was blown away by what they're doing for their students in their district. And they're, they're similar to us. They have three schools instead of school. They have one school that has different demographics than the other two schools. Um, what they have done for their students is so inspiring. Mm -hmm. And I think if our board and our teachers and our community could see the vision of what this will become <clears throat> nine or 10 years from now, I'm just bummed that my kids are going to be graduated and they won't have had the opportunity mm -hmm. to go to college with this kind of experience or get the experience to know, oh, no, I don't want to go to that college. That's not the right fit for me. I already figured that out in high school. I don't have to go to college mm -hmm. to figure that out or find myself or see what my passions are. So um, I really want to amplify that point, Casey, that you made Um Hearing You've heard somebody. Don and Jim and I were blown away by Ken Wallace at 207 mm -hmm. and what they've accomplished. Mm -hmm. um, I really think that would go a long way to helping anybody who's confused about how we could justify adding an administrator position beyond just because ISB is going to really make it hard for us not to have it. Um, really what, what this, what the vision and what this could become in 10 years. Yeah, so so, I, oh, I'm sorry. Go no, ahead. I think I, so on Friday I can talk to Lake Zurich, but I can call Ken and see if he'd be willing to to come something tells me he would i think so <laughs> so if one of us were to make a motion we would not be making a motion to approve this we're, we're making a motion to approve the position but we mm -hmm. wouldn't be making like can we amend this so that the, the job, job description i've been taking good notes on the suggestions you've been making and that's we would make those adjustments prior to posting. Yes, yeah, so you, you, your motion would be to approve this position and then our job is to uh, to create and amend the job description and get that posted and our um our recommendation is to get this approved and that we would um Yesenia and I would work and finalize this job description and try to get it out um you know tomorrow posted and especially when she's got you know meeting coming up that we're able to start mm -hmm. generating uh, Michael, move to approve. Before you do that, <laughs> we can still discuss. We can still discuss. You can. Go anyone ahead. want to say? There's something else you want to say? No, I just wanted oh. to be sure that before we had the motion, that if there was any other meaningful discussion There's, that needed to be. Well, we can discuss after the second. We, we I, I think this is time sensitive and we have to, we have to push forward with. Move to approve the new full time director of college and career readiness position. R. Michael. Lukarni second. Okay. Further discussion. Yeah. Um, not necessarily further discussion, but maybe to bring some of the parts of the discussion together. Um, I think that the the different facets that we've looked at this position are all really helpful. That helps this board make a really thoughtful decision. I think one of the other things that we're 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 trying to manage is how we grow as an organization. And unfortunately, administrative positions usually come in half or whole time positions. And so they seem more episodic. And as you're adding them, maybe oversized. One of the things that we made a commitment to during our negotiations last summer was to reduce class size for many of our sections. And in that we committed to having 3.0 FTE additional teachers built into our budget. So that is something that we that is an assumption we made and we will be you know assuming we have a very very similar student enrollment this year as we did last year so we will be increasing our teaching faculty we also last year increased our fte among our special education staff and our social workers and other things so i i guess the difference is when we are responding to classroom needs it's very gradual, two tenths here, three tenths there, this program. And every year we do that audit to say, what do we need to deliver a high quality program at the classroom level or at the school counselor level? When we are saying programmatically, what are some new leaders that we need or what are some new organizations that we need? Those come in bigger chunks. And so I, I just think that we have to appreciate both ways that our district can grow 
and to recognize that the strategic plan had all of those things growing by professional learning, growing by um, uh, program development, growing by really one or two positions. So we tried to have the plan be much more on building capacity of ourselves to do the work and very few opportunities to bring in additional um, administrators. I appreciate that point. And to reduce it to my non-educator level, this board has a track record of investing in both more teachers, more support staff, mm -hmm. and more administrators, not just more administrators. Mm -hmm. But you don't see that on the teaching and the, the assisting side, the people who are inter interfacing mm -hmm. with the students when we have these discussions or discuss mm -hmm. administrative positions. So no, I appreciate I, that. I, I think uh, my, my concern and my hesitation was not about the role. Mm -hmm. It was about the speed. Mm -hmm. at which we were moving. Yeah. Um, I would say that I was thinking I was not ready to vote for it coming in, mm -hmm. but balancing compliance with also our need for innovation, with also it being a part of our strategic plan. I mean, the compliance part now, I, I see it, but my, my concern was never about the role. This was always where we were going. I just felt like the speed at which we were going um, was too fast and it was going to be over. I mean, overwhelming for me has to be over. Hopefully will not be overwhelming when we look at if you're when, when it goes down to the teacher level and the student level. I mean, the opportunities that this role is going to provide for our students is something that I 100% am looking forward to watching. Um, but I think sometimes we go too fast and we have made a lot of significant changes in the last year that just wanted to kind of like chew on that for a little bit before we move on to the next. Mm -hmm. But in the, you know, to be true to competition and if they're true, you know, I, I can wrap my brain around it under compliance innovation. And this is a place that we wanted to be in the end. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, I think if we had, you know, if we had our choice, I think we would maybe go a little bit slower, but I think we're being pushed. Um, to, to do this much quicker. And I think this is the end result anyway, that, that we're ultimately going to have this role. So I appreciate where you're coming from though. My concern was, oh, great. We're hiring another administrator. I don't, I mean, I, I don't, I, I, that was my initial, but it's not as simple as that. It's, it's not more about, uh, we, we've had a lot of changes in the pieces of the puzzles, right. And, um, to add another layer. But in the end, this is going to be huge for our students so long as we are seeing they are in the buildings and they are talking to the, you know, they are touching the kids and being uh, not, not literally. <laughs> not <laughs> <laughs> I gave a certain That's first grader a hard person. <laughs> CCT presentation yeah. from earlier in the meeting. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I, I, I think I'm ready. But again, I, I don't want it was never the role. It was the speed. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. and I, I hope, felt the same way two days ago. And I hope anyone who has that same concern, which I think we all have when it comes to adding new administrators, they will look at the board packet and the information upon which we made this uh, decision and, and listen to this discussion that we had um, and, and really um, understand that we, we it, it's not about rushing to add administrators. I, I really hope people that have that concern will really stop and listen instead of just making assumptions or accusations because the work that came out of that committee, I think was um, really important and crucial to moving this forward along with the regulation. <laughs> and John, you really pushed me over the top there. Yeah, thanks for the I mean, I got to tell you, at, the, at that point, I was ready. Well, let's just make the motion. Let's move this forward mm -hmm. because uh, I heard you. Any other questions, comments? I look forward to some of the additional information, and I look forward to us all getting as excited as I think the three of us were after the uh, mm -hmm. presentation last night. I would like to night. participate, though, in talking to some districts. I know Lake Zurich mm -hmm. was somebody that we met during the conference. 
that has successfully implemented this and how, what did it look like? Because yeah. I do not think yeah. we should be reinventing the wheel. Mm -hmm. If the work is already right. done, let's avoid pitfalls and how, what was the best way to get buy-on from all of our, the stakeholders? Yeah. That would be a great role for a you. A lot of questions yeah. on this one. I, I would want you to do that. I want to do it too. We can't all go, but I, I, I think that would be great. Yeah. Okay. Unless you come up with a way of bringing, bringing them here. here. Yeah. Bringing them here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Maybe, Maybe to a committee meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. We need a roll call. We need a roll call. Mm -hmm. Hessel. Aye. Kolkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Okay, that passes. And as usual, the Program of Personnel Committee take consumes so much time. <laughs> we have one more item uh, to quickly get through, and that's an, an educational tour request uh, for the Vernon Hills ISA uh, Winter Congress in Indianapolis, Indiana. Anyone yes. have so, any questions or comments, or do you want to brief yeah, overview? This, this one did not uh, make it to PMP. This is a new request that came in this past week. It's for our junior state of America for Vernon Hills. Um, it's February 17th through the 19th in Indianapolis. We have about 14 students participating with, um, we estimate the student uh, fee will be about $300. Um, and there is about 4,400 that the district will cover and 3,000 of it is the bus. The buses are getting a little expensive. But yeah, that's, that's that, a tour. I would like to chaperone and I've stayed at that Marriott and it's going to be great time. <laughs> yeah. That. <laughs> yeah, that was like a, a great time. Um, I'd like to move to approve the educational tour request that occurred after the PMP meeting for the uh, JSA to Winter Congress in Indianapolis. That, that was Hessel. 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 <laughs> Carmichael second. Okay. Any further questions, Thank comments? You. Roll call, please. Cole Carney. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Okay, motion passes. And now uh, I think it goes over to some facilities and finance yep. items. Uh, item F, uh, fiscal year 2022 annual comprehensive financial report. Uh, yeah, excited. We have our fiscal year 22 mm -hmm. financial uh, report there for you. Uh, we are going to have Betsy, um, our auditor, come to our FNF meeting in February. To but kind is of talk she still through. traumatized from last year's February? <laughs> uh, nope, she's doing just fine. She's, I think she's okay. visiting. Should we send her flowers yeah. to get her to come? Uh, thinking of you. Uh -huh. She'll be good. I think she's visiting a, a, a daughter somewhere. <laughs> um, so she'll come to our committee meeting uh, to talk through some things. Uh, so overall, overall, I guess what I would what I would share is, um, you know, because of the change in in accounting for property taxes, they 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 restate last year and so and then they they changed that year. So really, essentially, last year um, there was a, an operating deficit about of a million dollars, mostly due to that change in property tax thing. However. There is one thing in there that is weird that I just want you to be aware of now, and I want to explain a little bit, um, and hopefully Betsy will talk more about it too, is if you ever get into the parts of the reports and you read interest income, it'll look like we lost $1.8 million of interest income. That did not happen in real life. So we actually received like 500000 of interest income. However, this is one one of the things I refer to as a And I, there's an adjective that I'm not going to use, a, a bad accounting rule, not a bad one, but I don't like it, um, where because of our requirement to report on gap, um, in investments need to be reported based on fair market value as of June 30th. So as of June 30th, the, the investments we have are all in like CDs and treasuries and these things like that, that we hold to maturity and we'll never lose a penny. Right. But the value of them, if we decided to sell them on June 30th, if we decide, so essentially what it's saying is if we sold all of our investments in the secondary markets on June 30th, we would have lost $1.8 million. We never will do that. And so, but that was the fair market value. It's almost like, it's almost like you have a mortgage on your house and you get the assessment back and the assessment is lower than what you owe on the mortgage. 
it doesn't matter if you're never selling your house. Like it doesn't, you, it never is coming to fruition. So that's just a little bit of a frustrating thing when I saw those reports come back showing that we lost money. We absolutely did not lose any money. We actually received about $500,000 in interest income last year, but because we have to report based on fair market value, that's why it's reported the way it is. So I said my piece about that. And so, Thank you. but I'm excited that our financial reports are done. We're processing now our projections for our, our February committee meeting. Okay. Can I get a motion to approve the fiscal year 2022 annual comprehensive financial report as presented? Drumkey, so moved. That's in second. Oh, and one more thing. This is the first time now that you have financial reports that show our fund balance that does not include early taxes because those are all now fully deferred. So like from here going forward, there's no more yeah, fund balance. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, let's take out early. It's not, it's, yeah. they're fully deferred now. So it'll be, it'll be much more clear going forward. Thank you for doing much that. Cleaner. Yes. Thank you for, for bringing that to us and making us more comfortable with that. Any discussion? Uh, roll call, please. Carol. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kolkarni. Aye. Okay, moving on. Item G, uh, Vernon Hills High School weight room flooring replacement. I don't believe we had an actual number on this at the FNF committee meeting, correct? Um, we So uh, first of all, I copied another item and I wrote in the wrong number. So no, this is not a million dollar weight room replacement. <laughs> um, but if you look a few minds down, it's 52,000. So we, so um, we, it was on the list um, that we, was that, in, was that earlier this month? Yes. It was on the list earlier this month. Sorry, my months are running together. It was on the list earlier this mm -hmm. month with a placeholder. And so what I did is the report you have has that updated list with new numbers that are in there. So you could see what the old number was and what the new number was. So I believe that one, we had a placeholder for like 65,000. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The actual cost is 52. So that one's less, but you'll see other ones. There's ones that are a little bit more, but there's some notes attached to that as well. So I'm just going to give the, the kind of the overall sense of the, mm -hmm. the three projects here. Uh, these are all under cooperative purchasing agreements. And so these are already nationally bid um, projects to fully comply with the law. And um, the, each one of those has the updated, so you get a sense of kind of the total as we're going. Um, and then I can, I'll let Mark explain each individual project. Can I ask a procedural question first? Cause it, all three of these fall into that. Um, did these go through the normal bid process? Like, are we there? I don't, I don't know why I'm lost on that, but normally we send something out to bid. We get a sheet back that says these companies bid yeah, so all three of these are part of part of national purchasing contracts. Okay. So that's the cooperatives that right. these are already been pre bid. Out. They've okay. already been pre bid out. And that's what I wanted to know. You can jump on those contracts. Thank you. Yes, and I mentioned uh, at FNF that I was late getting this one. Um, they hadn't gotten me the updated numbers at that time, but I would be bringing it. Um, or we would be bringing it, you know, for tonight. Um, and a good thing because we're under under budget for what we well we had looked at numbers in the past um so um we just look for a motion for um to approve the weight room flooring um you know it's part of the summer summer project for 2022 uh the contract with direct fitness uh for vernon hills high school for fifty two thousand four hundred sixty two dollars and twelve cents that's also moved that's in second any other discussion? Okay. Roll call, please. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kokarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Moving on to LHS chiller replacement, item H. Okay. Um, you'll see I'm responsible for putting this one over the $1.1 million budget because I wanted a contingency. Um, and obviously the contingency is uh, if we do run into any issues, um, yeah. you know, well, we, we have it covered. Otherwise the money is not spent. It comes off the contract. So um, same thing, this uh, motion to approve contract for train to replace the chillers at LHS for $1,111,783. 
This is a turnkey project. I mean, they're doing the engineering development, it's their equipment. Um, they're installing it, uh, programming it, you know, through our BAS system. Um, the whole full project through that. Okay. And do we anticipate any um, trouble getting the parts or equipment on time? Uh, no, we don't. We're anticipating it won't be done over the summer. We'll wait till the end of the cooling season. So this is a perfect time you can work in, in the chiller plant and we can isolate and demo once cooling season is down. So then we have that um, the late fall and winter and be ready to, to fire it up in the spring. Understood. But no supply chain issues to anticipate on this. No, we we're anticipating getting the, the units in the fall. Terrific. Carmichael moved to approve the LHS chiller replacement as part of the summer 2023 capital projects. Rooney second. I just have one question uh, with this. Do we expect to see any reduced bills um, because the equipment is more energy efficient? Yes, well, we, this is a more energy efficient equipment. So we're expecting <clears throat> to see um, a decrease in our bills. And I don't have numbers yet. We're also going to apply for ComEd um, refunds for um, us uh, changing the equipment out and putting energy efficient in. I don't have those numbers to share, um, but it, it could be a nice, nice amount of money. Good question. Great. And it's also refrigeration yeah, uh, the refriger compliant. The, the refrigeration refrigerants. that they're using is about $2,000 a pound you know, or higher. Um, um, you, can't get it. And you, can, you, you can get it, but it's very pricey. You get it in an emergency. So. <laughs> or which ironically has to be refrigerated <laughs> any other discussion all right uh roll call please carol benjamin aye carmichael aye drumkey aye hessel aye kulkarni aye rooney aye batson aye all right motion passes moving on to i uh vernon hills high school baseball infield yeah so um this is uh Again, another uh, contract um, for using a co-op. Um, the baseball infield uh, is at its end of its life. Um, so we look to replace it at Vernon Hills. So look for a motion to approve the contract with field turf to replace the baseball field at Vernon Hills for 212152 and 86 cents. That's also moved. Drumkey second. All right, any other discussion on that one? It's going to be okay. a nice logo, nice infield. Yeah. <laughs> I might have to catch a game. <laughs> uh, roll call, please, Carol. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kolkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. All right, motion passes. Uh, moving on to J, disposal of equipment. Uh, looks like we have a few things that need to be disposed of. And can I get a motion to approve the items for disposal? Carmichael, so moved. That's in second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kolkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. All right, motion passes. And that concludes the facilities and finance items. Terrific. We will turn it over to Dr. Herman for the superintendent's report. Yes, um, I see some of the students are needing to go, and I appreciate you staying and participating in the meeting. And I also want to thank you because the surveys that you are doing of your peers feed directly into this particular initiative. Um, we have uh, with our labor management committee, um, Dr. Sanchez will be working with some teachers and some special education coordinators to look at what are the things that worked well during our um, December um, uh, exam schedule and what are some other things that we know we can do even better. Um, in the background information, I described some of the things that you all described too from 2019 until now, we've had four different schedules because of COVID. Um, and some of them being remote and other things like that. So we definitely um, have have had some adjustments and flexibility 
um, and appreciate student and staff patience as we navigate through this. Um, but your voice will definitely be brought forward. So we have a committee that will be meeting next week. They are going to meet two times, and then they'll be forwarding a recommendation to administration um, on uh, really trying to find the schedule that will meet most of the needs that we're identifying. So the idea of having uh, exams spread out over more days, but we're also held accountable to minutes of instruction on each day from ISBE. So we have some things that are at polarity with each other. We also know that um, some of our students had a difficult time who are eligible for extended time. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're building in cushions on our day for things like that too. Um, so we feel that between student input and staff input, um, we'll be able to bring um, and recommend um, the final exam schedule at the February uh, PMP meeting. Which will answer the question, do second semester seniors have to take finals in classes where they have an A? Yeah. <laughs> I vote no. <laughs> that, we're not voting on that. That's not for us yeah. to vote on. <laughs> I we look forward to the recommendation. Mm -hmm. I also like one of the ideas I think the students had where can the teaching be completed with enough time where students can actually study before the exam? Because mm -hmm. I think I've run into that at home myself. So, Well, and I think that Again, not that the grading and assessment committee can answer all questions, but I do think that having guidelines like that would be one of the um, benefits of recommendations coming from that committee. One more thing we forgot to add. We don't want to have finals on a Wednesday and a Thursday. We would rather have them beginning of the week. That was a popular comment. We just forgot to include it, but because having them at the end of the week was not helpful. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Hmm. Good to know. Thank you for adding that. And we're happy to share that data with the committee if that's convenient. Oh, apps. I was I was yeah. counting on that. So for sure. So you can send it to Dr. Sanchez and myself. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Moving on to board comments and events, as you've already heard, uh, Don, Jim, and I, um, and uh, also Kara Benjamin attended the Ed Red dinner last night. You've already heard. I think the most meaningful takeaway for us was there anything that you wanted to add beyond that session? that we attended. <clears throat> no, it's always lovely to go and kind of see what's happening in, uh, you know, that end of our professional world and um, always enlightening. I enjoyed the keynote speaker, although I think we do a fabulous job with branding already, but I, I found what uh, she had to say interesting and useful. Um, and we always... got to sit with the uh, Senator Adrian yes, Johnson. Mm -hmm. That was that Which was actually was extremely enlightening, fun. really a treat, and yeah. just really uh, impressive. And it was really a, um, a wonderful opportunity to um, strengthen our relationship mm -hmm. um, that Dr. Herman has mm -hmm. really solidified with her. As and we get we got to sit with her last year as well. Yeah. So for those of us who got to chat with her again, it's mm -hmm. always welcome. We also learned that she was recently named as the chair for the education committee. Um, uh, so today was she named? She was yes. she. Well, she said last night that she was going to be. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think today they were announcing okay. the Thank committees you. for um, the 103rd Congress. So um, Thank you for the that is on that. that is yes. such great. That's a great point. It was great news that she shared that that she'd been on the education committee and uh, had chaired it before and was planning to continue. So yay. Mm -hmm. That's a great resource for us. Mm -hmm. Any other um, events or training? I did go to a session on um, the uh, free speech in the digital age, uh, which was interesting. Um, and the idea that we can restrict speech, there's, there's just none of it. There, there's very few cases where districts are successful at saying that they can they can regulate or stop speech, especially on digital platforms and especially outside of school, um, that the courts have favored uh, students' rights and parents' rights to express their opinions. And if they are not similar to our opinions, it doesn't matter. You don't have to like them. I would agree. I think one of the other things that I read an article on last week was 
that is true when it's opinion, but as soon as it goes into bullying and harassment absolutely, or hate speech. So I, I think that everyone has the right disruption. to express their perspective, but going back to our opening presentation about safety and security sure. and building relationships, it, it, it goes from right to express to needing to protect individuals. Right. Mm -hmm. And the uh, ability to limit teachers and staff when they are doing performing their duties, um, we have a very strong case law that supports um, restricting free speech in that mm -hmm. specific environment. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other board comments or events we want to discuss? Uh, I attended um, the Libertyville High School Jazz Festival mm. on Thursday night, this last Thursday, um, took my kids. I've got a small clarinet player in my house, mm. so it was a, a great <laughs> thing to take him to to kind of see what's to come if he continues. But I think what was so great about the Jazz Festival is not only did it showcase um, our uh, our jazz lab band and our jazz ensemble over at LHS, but it also gave, um, well, at least us as, as an audience, um, the opportunity to see the feeder schools, some of our feeder schools, uh, and how they kind of work their way up to this incredible level of performance that our high school students have. So we got to see um, the Oak Grove School Jazz Band perform, as well as Highlands Jazz Band perform. Um, and then, like I said, the jazz lab ensemble, I'm sorry, the jazz lab band and the jazz ensemble. And, um, they also had, um, I guess the students were able to work with a visiting professor who was a guest artist. His name was Dr. Matt Pivek. And, um, incidentally, was it, were you, did you happen to catch the show? I wasn't at the show, but I... I am aware of the guest artist. I can't remember if it was um, Mr. Voigt or Mr. Cardenstead's um, former professor, mm -hmm. but he came to work with the students during the week and even played along with them at the performance. So not only did we get to see our students perform, but we got to see bona fide professional uh, jazz artist. And so it was wonderful, but I just wanted to shout out to Dustin Helvey, our fine arts supervisor over at LHS, uh, Mr. Ben Voigt, uh, who was the Jazz Lab Band director, uh, and Mr. Matt Carnset, who directed the Jazz Ensemble, and uh, we just we so enjoyed it. And like I always say, anytime I per anytime I'm able to attend a fine arts performance, either here at Vernon Hills or at Libertyville High School, I'm reminded just how we have world class fine arts uh, education available to our kids and that we are just so lucky to enjoy it as members of the community. I thank you for attending. And um, it is a really um, a proud tradition that when we do our festivals, so we have a choir festival, a band festival, an orchestra festival, and the jazz festival, we do partner with our um, middle schools and um, we invite a guest conductor to each one of those who's either um, really well established well it's both usually they're very well established in the field um, professionally and they have some connections to our community as well um, and so um, you saw the jazz that was our fourth in our series and um, thank you for recognizing the tremendous talent of the students and the tremendous work of the staff because um, in my opinion it is second to none yeah I could have sworn I wasn't at a high school auditorium mm -hmm. I was somewhere else. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Um, moving on to the IASB report. Yeah, just a couple of things. <clears throat> Some of you um, may have seen a um, noticed that uh, um, Tom Bertrand, who's the executive director for uh, IASB, has now been um, hired as the executive director for the Consortium of State School Boards Associations. Say that three times real quick. Uh, or COSPA, COSPA, whatever. It's the new national organization that our that IASB belongs to. So we're going to have a lot of hmm. Illinois influence on the national organization. I have high hopes for that. I know we typically haven't been as involved in the, the national organization in the past, but 23 states in this past year spun off and created a new national uh, school board association organization at a national level their inaugural uh conference is 
um, coming up in, at the end of March. Uh, and while it's probably a little late for us to attend that at this point, uh, you know, maybe we can uh, look at uh, future years to maybe participate in that, depending on where that's located. But just wanted to bring that to your attention uh, for the um, the national uh, organization. Uh, also, um, on Fr on Saturday, February 11th, um, Libertyville High School will be hosting a um, legislative breakfast. So legislators are from the area are invited to attend and uh, any IS, IASB member school can send, you know, board members, uh, administrators, whatever, to participate in that. That happens uh, on the, the morning of February 11th. So and I'm happy to be able to. What's the time of that? Uh, uh, breakfast starts at 8.30. And it concludes at? At about, uh, probably about 10. 10. The, the program will start about 9.00. So um, if any of the members that were attending, they could actually stick around because best buddies, right? that's best buddies for the Best Buddies Carnival after that. Calendar. Yeah, I put it in my calendar too. Yeah. Who was it that talked about Best Buddies? At, yeah, yeah, that's going to be that same day. I put it in my calendar at the same time when you were talking about it. And sorted it. Yeah, so if mm -hmm. any, uh, <laughs> any gotcha. board members wants to uh, attend, uh, let Carol know because we have to register and there's a small fee to attend. But just wanted to shout out to uh, LHS for uh, uh, helping us host that uh, on behalf of the Lakes Division. This is a Lakes Division uh, uh, initiative that we're trying to do. That. We did them in the past, and we felt that uh, this might be a good time to reenact this type of uh, of event. So, and we appreciate trying. your leadership on the Lakes Division board. Do you have any sense of which legislative which legislators might have committed to attending it? I don't. Uh, I do know Adrian may come at the very beginning but can't stay for the the presentation i spoke to her last night about it but she was going to try to at least you know stop by and say hello but uh, i know she's not able to but i don't know who else will be and that's all i have for ASB. okay terrific um do we have any other reports for tonight before we conclude then i will be looking for a motion to adjourn uh sorry to convene future agenda Oh, sorry. Thank you. Future agenda items. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, we have uh, noted on the agenda some items that we'll be seeing in uh, February as well as March. Um, are there any items that board members wish to bring forward for future agenda items that do not appear on this list? I have one question. Uh, back when the students had come to talk about the Diwali holiday, uh, there was an action taken just to look at calendars and what should the approach be and secular or not and all of that. So just wanted to see when we can get an update. Um, I know that we are working with our equity team on that. Do you have a, a, a specific update, Yesenia? Yes. So Larry um, looked at um, many districts in the state and there are none that recognize Diwali yet. So um, we're um, hoping to collaborate with our, our feeder districts and kind of um, work on here here are the things that we're recognizing can we come to an agreement and then bring a full recommendation i know that we had discussed perhaps developing some standards by which we would use for requests um, because i know certainly there are other holidays that students might um, ask us to recognize including diwali um, <laughs> I hope that that will be part of the conversation because the, from an equity standpoint, I, I'm sure that you and Larry have already gone down this road, but we want to have a set of standards to apply um, as opposed to it appearing subjective, like this group gets it, but this group doesn't. That that really isn't the position that we ever want to be in. And I know a lot of school districts have gone to a completely non-holiday calendar. And I have a sense that that might be where we're all headed. Um, certainly would look to, you know, the team for recommendations on that. But but I hope that developing some standards by which we will um, evaluate this and other requests could be developed as part of the conversation just so that our choices don't appear in any way subjective. Yeah, I thought that was kind of I thought that was kind of what I was looking forward to is how do you make that decision? Mm -hmm. um, so any update on that would be would be great. Thank you. 
Okay. So now I will look for a motion to adjourn, sorry, to convene an executive closed session. In closed session for the purpose uh, of discussing employment of an employee under uh, Section 5 ILCS 120 2C1. Carmichael, so moved. Rooney, second. Thank you. We are um, going to convene session. And when we return, we can do a roll call. oh, sorry, we have yeah. to do a roll call. <laughs> I'm really tired, obviously. Aye. Oh, okay. Kolkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Thank Aye. you. Aye. Motion uh, carries, and we are uh, going to convene in closed session. When we return to open session, no further action will be taken. And at that point, we will adjourn. Thank That's you. to ask for a motion and a second to return to open session so moved. at 11 17 p.m drunky so moved rooney second uh voice vote all in favor say aye. Aye. aye 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 any opposed the motion carries may i now have a motion and a second to adjourn the board meeting at 11 17 michael so moved voice vote all in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. any opposed and the motion carries, we are adjourned.